town, right here in Boulder, Colorado. So from the power of the Rocky Mountains in Boulder, Colorado, I bring you the Prince of Power. For it's time. I said it's time. It's time to do an interview. Big Van Vader style. So we're going to start this right at your birth. I understand uh, your mother had to be induced early due to you being 11 pounds, 10 ounces. Yeah, I was a pretty big baby. Yeah, you know, the, the, the 11 pound, 10 ounce thing was, is if I go term, that's, that's a big baby, huge baby. But I was born at seven months and three weeks. So I was a premature baby at that, that size. So they, they were saying if I had gone term, it would have, it was, it could have been a record baby, you know, 15 pound baby, something like that. And everyone always associates you with being from uh, the Rocky Mountains. You do live in Boulder and have a big history in Colorado. But you actually grew up in Compton, which uh, a lot of people don't know about. Uh, yeah, actually I was born and raised in, in uh, I was born in, excuse me, I was born in Linwood, California, and that's uh, uh, St. Francis Hospital, that's where the hospital was. So technically I was born there, but we were living in Compton and probably until I was, you know, 10, 11 years old, I uh, lived in Compton, and um, my mother had family, and her mother lived in, in Compton, uh, my aunt lived in Compton, and there was a, an uncle that I think also lived in Compton, so we had a few people in Compton. We actually lived only a couple blocks from Compton College, so it, that'll tell everyone. We were on the boulevard uh, just, I don't know, west of, of Compton College, I believe. Toward the, toward the river, the Los Angeles River. What was it like growing up in that kind of an area? It's well, you know what, it just, it, obviously you were confronted, you know, physically, you know, a, a lot, and uh, you either ran or, or you fought, and, you know, most of the time I ran, and a lot of times you, you, you had to stand your ground and fight. But as a young kid like that, you're, when, when you're confronted by superior odds, if you're on, you know, if you're on your stingray and you're by yourself and several, two or three guys are coming after you, you know, you, you, you try to evade. And, uh, but it, it, I don't know, it, living in L.A. during that era was kind of like predator and prey. You always, when you walked out the door, you were conscious of other people because in, in, in Colorado, it's where I live in Boulder, Colorado, it, uh, you know, you, you basically just acknowledge someone else, but you don't, you're not afraid that they're going to hurt you or attack you. And in, in Los Angeles during this era, and maybe today, I don't know, I'm, I'm not speaking for them today, but when I was there, it was like this, this predator prey. You came out and this is, is my predator or is my prey <laughs> type thing. So it, it was different, different way of life. And I understand you had a home break-in experience when you were younger. Yeah. Uh, well, it's going way back. My uh, parents were out and they were dancing at a, uh, I don't know, it was Friday night and they were having a good time. You know, they both worked hard. And so my sister and I uh, were home alone. And, you know, it wasn't like we were babies, but we were pretty young. I was, I, was, uh, I think, eight or nine and she was a couple years older than me. And we were watching Star Trek and the, the old one. This is how old I am. The, uh, Oh, with William Shatner. Yeah, the one with Shatner and the real Spock, not not this, not this. Leonard Nimoy. <laughs> yeah, Leonard Nimoy. So, uh, we were watching those original series, and uh, two men had broken the window in the back and opened it, and one one when I I got up and I looked, I was barefoot and we were watching TV and Southern Cal everyone was barefoot, and uh, I looked and he was standing on my bed helping the other guy in, and these guys were you know. They were, they were, the, the intent, and you could just tell that they, they had bad intentions. And I, I screamed at my sister, and we ran out the front door, and they chased us. They, they were there for a reason, and I'll never forget that. And we ran down to a neighbor's house, and he came, he came, he had, he, you know, everyone has a gun in L.A. by the door, you know, shotgun or something. He grabbed his gun and, and uh, came to our house, and they'd gone, they'd, they'd escaped back out the window, the backyard window. And your father was in the uh, U.S. Navy, uh, and I understand he invented something that was... Yeah, he, he uh, my dad was a very intelligent guy, and big, strong guy, and uh, smart. He, he invented the electric hoist, and 
The thing, the thing about it is he didn't realize what he had because they, they made millions of those things. And uh, he sold the, the plans. He sold, he sold the original two he made and the plans. And uh, so he, 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 he still made some money, you know, building them, but good money, but not uh, the millions that we, we, we would have had. I'd have been a millionaire, baby, so. But apparently it was enough money to move from Compton to Bell. No, actually, we, we moved to Anaheim and bought a real nice house with that money. Okay. And then from there, came back to Bell, and that's where I went to high school. What were some of your uh, sporting accomplishments in high school? Hmm. I shot put it in track, but really wasn't very good. I mean, I, I did okay. Um, um, but as a, a football player, we, you know, you have all Southeast and all, all Conference and all, all Eastern League, and then the... All American and then All Los Angeles, and you notice I put All Los Angeles team after All American. So the team to make when you were a Los Angeles football player wasn't the All American team; was the All Los Angeles team because that was the premier team. The you figure there's seven, eight hundred high schools in Los Angeles at the time, and that first team All Los Angeles was, you know, the best high school players in America. I mean, and don't get me wrong, there's other one, there's good players in Texas, and there's good players in Cincinnati, and there's good players everywhere, but. You would see all Americans on other teams that you know couldn't couldn't compete on that Los Angeles team because it's just uh, the competition in Los Angeles is just crazy. And what schools recruited you out of high school? Uh, probably forty or fifty. You know, SC and UCLA and uh, uh, Oregon. Uh, God, it, it Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado. I mean, it, it just goes on and on. Air Force. Actually, it was going to be the Air Force. Uh, I had a nomination, a congressional nomination, to uh, attend the Air Force Academy. And what made you choose go to school here in Boulder? You know what? Uh, you're in Boulder. It's obviously beautiful. It's it's it, it's actually to the point where it's majestic. It's blue skies and uh, mountains, and it was a very sleepy town. In other words, I grew up in L.A. with the smog and the traffic, and suddenly I was in an, in an environment where I could go to school uh, and play top football because they were the second or third ranked team in the country the year before I was coming. And, uh, uh, but yet the college was in a town that had 28,000 people, which was really attractive to me because, you know, being around the masses wasn't something that I, I, uh, wanted to do. Obviously I wanted to get away from that. Did you get a lot of celebrity like attention uh, with the town being so small and the football team drawing? I guess you were telling me earlier, forty to sixty thousand fans a game. Uh, actually it was it was, you know, probably more like sixty five to seventy thousand. It was we were pretty much sold out every game. Uh, but, you know, again we were playing we were you know, we were playing good football and we were like an Orange Bowl team one year and uh, Big A champions the next team, next year. So it was it was a good good time in my life. Huh? I mean, to go to school in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, playing football and being young. Wow, that was a lot of fun. So I'm guessing the partying was pretty good too. Yeah, <laughs> the beer was cold and the women were pretty. And you ended up being drafted uh, 80th overall by the L.A. Rams after uh, college. What was it like uh, going back to L.A.? Great. I mean, it was a homecoming. The, the problem that put a damper on that party was I uh, was a projected first-round pick, you know, and actually the first two or three picks in the first round. Uh, I was the number one ranked center in the country. I had played guard at, as an All-American guard. I was a preseason All-American at tackle throughout, throughout the course of my career at Colorado and uh, ended up at center. Centers are, are, are generally the, I don't know, um, probably the brightest guy on the line because you know they they're the quarterback on the line. Quarterbacks are the brightest guys on on the team, and they have to memorize you know hundreds and thousands of plays and different variations of plays. And, and it's probably not quite that extreme with the center, but you have a front side calls if if the play is going to the right, you have a front side call and a back side call, and the the defense shifts. And then you have to call off and make make new calls front side back side with your front side guard your back side guard and your your back side tackle so you know it uh, to be a center in the NFL yeah you have to you 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 have to have some uh, gray matter between your ears so uh, 
but I ruptured a patellar tendon just six weeks before the, the NFL draft and was still drafted the 80th pick, which is extremely respectable. And uh, so it was, again, it was a homecoming, but there was a damper, you know, I actually flew to LA with a cast on and, and uh, you know, I had to fight my way up from there. Is it true that you made the front page of the LA Times when you were signed? Yeah, yeah. yeah because of the front page, man. It was, you know, all those girls, girls that, you know, the homecoming queen and the, the homecoming princess and all those really pretty girls that you, maybe you just couldn't quite date because, you know, you weren't good enough looking. Well, suddenly I was good enough looking. So I had the, I had the, the big car and the, I had bought a, a fourplex on the beach in uh, Belmont Shore. So it was a lot of fun going home. The thing is, you were always known as a very strong person. I imagine around the time you were in the NFL, you were probably at your strength peak. Uh, what are some of your your lifts that people might want to know about? You know, I I, I had done a 580 bench at one point in my career, and I was as a Ram, I I, I was pretty strong. Um, I I think I was better known as a wrestler for. You know, because you get beat up and your wrist and your elbow and, and the bench press kind of goes away. You mainly you bench press for reps, you know, 315, 365, stuff like that. But um, I could take 365 pounds behind my neck and jump press it 15 times, you know, just a straight military press. And that was pretty good. That was, that's, that's world class. You're one of the lucky few that got to play in the Super Bowl. Very few wrestlers actually have played in the Super Bowl. I guess Steve McMichael might be one of the other few. Uh, it was Super Bowl Twenty Four, I believe, against Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that like playing in that? It was surreal. I mean, uh, and you actually had play time, correct? Yeah, it was an accum accumulation of a lot of a lot of hopes and dreams, and although it wasn't where I expected to be at that time, uh, you know, because of the injury coming in, I didn't didn't have the higher pick. Uh, you know, as if had, had I been drafted in the first round, I would have went to a lesser team where the Los Angeles Rams was a Super Bowl team, and they're loaded. I mean, they, they've got all pro linemen and all pro wide receivers and all pro. So it was a different situation being drafted in the third round rather than the first. How many years did you have in the NFL total? I think four. And what led uh, you to switch over to wrestling? Um... Well, necessity. I mean, let's face it, four years isn't, isn't uh, I mean, it's it's a cup of coffee. It's all it was. But it was, you know, the Super Bowl made it bittersweet, you know, because you got to taste and you wanted more, but, you know, you had to leave. Um, the injuries were just too much. Well, no, they, they just said, Leon, it's just not going to work out. They, they were looking for a player that was making less money and had two good knees. And, you know, in all, all due respect to them, you... You couldn't argue with him. I mean, I was pretty beat up at that time and ruptured my patellar tendon. So. And I heard a story that uh, you just walked backstage at an AWA show uh, when you were hadn't got into the business yet and actually ran into Bruiser Brody. Is that yeah. yeah. Um, I, you know, I had gone down there and I was, for some reason, I thought all wrestlers were huge. And I, I remember I was, I was a very comfortable 315 pounds and I had ballooned up. Um, God, I don't know, 385, 390, just to, <laughs> just to go to the, the show. It was a, Gene Reed was the promoter, and um, Brad Riggins was running a camp in Minnesota. And Brad is famous for you know, coaching a lot of people. Uh, Brock Lesnar and, and Kurt Henning. Bradshaw, even, I think. Bradshaw, yeah, myself. It, 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 Rick he, Steiner. It, Rick Steiner was his uh, Yeah, yeah his, 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 Brad Riggins' list is uh, extensive. He actually told that, Rick Steiner actually told us a story about you going through a wall with Riggins. Yeah. Well, see, Brad was in the 1980, uh, no, it was supposed to be in the 1980 Olympics, and he was the odds-on favorite to win the gold. Because in 1979, he had beat uh, the Russian that won the gold when we, when we boycotted in 1980. And so Brad was, I mean, as good as it got, period. And... Uh, I was big and strong and lifting weights, but I mean, we were, we had locked up and we we were tussling pretty good, and boy, he planted his hips and he went one way and I went the other and I went right through a wall. You know, it was, it was funny because I, I remember the I had knocked the door. It was actually a restroom and I had knocked the knocked the door off and it was on my head and I was staring at the toilet, so it was pretty 
pretty humbling. So you want to be a wrestler, you know, uh, this five foot ten inch, uh, you know, who's substantially smaller than me, uh, coach, you just threw your ass through the wall. So what are you going to do about it? You get you get yourself up and you get back in line and and uh, you do it again. Okay. Did he have an actual ring or was it amateur wrestling match? No, he had a ring. He had a ring and you know we we did both and. He, what he had is he had a really a beautiful home and he had a it was an indoor pool and he he drained the water and cemented the pool over and put a wrestling match a wrestling ring on it and started the school so it tells you you know wrestlers love wrestling. Uh, what was your uh, fr connection like with Rick Steiner at that time? Um, you know he was one of the guys in, in our, Rick is Rob is. Uh, Extremely strong and extremely athletic, and uh, you know one one of the best wrestlers ever, I'd say. I guess Scott Norton would have been trained by Reagan too, wouldn't he? Yeah, sure. Yeah, but he was after me. After you. Um, and did you have much contact with Vern Gagne? Obviously, you had. Some. Yeah, we we I went to work for him so quite a bit actually. He you know basically during camp he had come over and uh, uh, you know watched watched me and. There was another guy there, another football player named Greg Boy. He was watching him, and you know the other guys in the school, and uh, so that was it. You know, we were going to graduate from school and go to work for him, and that's exactly what we did. What was his personality like? Because a lot of people have said he was always good on his word with paying, but he could have temper tantrums. And I have no, I, you know what? I have nothing bad to say about him. He. You know, maybe our dealings weren't that extensive, but, you know, I got, you know, there was, wasn't a promise that was broken to me or, I mean, he said, hey, I'll give you work, and he gave me work, and he paid me good money, and uh, I, I thought, you know, my opportunities starting out were, were okay, and then, you know, he, he called me in his office, and Big Otto Vance was there in the AW offices. He was looking for a big baby face, uh, or big heel, to come over, and I was a baby face there in the AWA, so, yeah. Uh, Big Otto, you know, needed someone my size to, you know, come over and fight him because he couldn't get sympathy. He was, he was what, you know, 400 pounds and a little shorter than me. So, uh, how would you like to go to Europe? And this is the kind of pay you could get. And sounds good. Beer's cold, you know. So, I wanted to go. Yeah. How so, popular was wrestling in Europe in those oh, days? Oh, Jesus, crazy. You know, we were like to talk of the town. We, we would travel around from town to town, and we would see there. We, you know, rather than then spend, you know, a day in a town and then move on to the next town. We would spend six weeks, eight weeks, you know, maybe maybe longer. And we'd have a tournament and the people would follow the tournament. So it was a, you know, point system. And so Vader won, but, you know, he got disqualified the next night. So you're taking away points. And so it was a pretty complicated system that they had devised and people could follow along. And obviously throughout the course of the the tournament, you know, you, you go up and down and make the make the ratings or rankings uh, interesting for the fans. Back to the uh, AWA, how did you come up with the Baby Bull name? Uh, Baby Bull was a nickname I had in college as a football player, so that carried over. And then Baby Bull turned into Bull Power to uh, the Bull, and then... Finally, all that gave away to Vader when Anoki gave me the Vader character. And I understand you had quite a few matches with Bruiser Brody when you first started. Yeah, if you could call him that. He, he, uh, he didn't have much patience for guys starting out, and uh, so I, I, I earned my money. Let's put it that way. What was he like uh, outside of the ring? Did you have any contact? With Not him? much. No, he was pretty quiet. I think he he hung out with Stan Hansen. And uh, they'd get together in a room and drink beer and he'd talk. But other than that, he was pretty quiet and to himself. Did you really have to fight for everything you had in those matches? To yeah, begin? sure. And uh, what did you think and about... And sometimes it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> was he just a temperamental guy and just... No, no, I, I wouldn't say that. He just, he knew what he wanted to do. And, you know, if, if he didn't want to sell for a, a guy starting out, he didn't have to. He was that, that big in the business. And what did you think about his uh, his murder that took place? Um, you know, I, I don't know enough to, to talk about it other than you know, I was shocked and saddened to, to lose it. I mean, a great wrestler. 
Um, is there any reason why you never wrestled in Puerto Rico yourself? Yeah, because of that. I had got offers. I was uh, in my early part of my career in Japan. I just started for Noki. And Masao Hattori, the referee in Japan, everyone kind of knows him. And he said, I gave your name to uh, Carlos Colon. And I said, I won't go. I wouldn't go. I, I couldn't f see myself in a dispute over money or a finisher, you know, and having, you know, having to defend myself and say, no, I'm going over because you promised me I'm going over and not being able to back that position up, you know, because you couldn't leave town and you, so it's just a situation you didn't, don't get in. And you brought up Stan Hansen. Uh, there's quite a few parts of your career connected with him, but what about those early AWA days? Between, between Brody and, and Hansen, I think, you know, two of the best big men ever. Uh, just, I mean, God, how do you get better than Stan Hansen? How do you get, I mean, Stan could work 30 minutes, he could work 15, he could work in Japan, he could work in Puerto Rico, he could work in Texas, I mean, he could work every, anywhere. And uh, same with Brody. I mean, it's unusual to find two talents like that so closely together, in, you know, in terms of time. Was it similar to Brody in those early days wrestling Stan where they wouldn't be willing to give much to a newcomer? Um, I don't know. I think they both were basically, you know, respect is earned. In other words, if, if you put the time in and but didn't know what you were doing, you know, they, they wouldn't give it, give it to you. But if, you know, you had, you were prepared to take the next step from, you know, just being a total beginner, uh, yeah, they would, they would explore with you a little bit. Were you in the company when uh, Stan walked out on the company as champion? Yeah. Yeah, I remember he he, uh, he had a belt and he had taken a hammer to it and he was hollering and boy, the, no, one, no one did anything. He was romping was in the and dressing stomping. Room? Huh? Was this in the dressing room? Well, yeah, just, you know, I don't want to stand. Stan and I are good friends, I don't want to. But he... Uh, he did tell us that, he, that something had happened to the belt, so he didn't deny that. No, he, he, yeah, he tore up the belt, and then he took his truck and ran it over. So, What was the, what was the uh, reaction like in the dressing room in the weeks after that? With, uh, well, you know, hey, you know, it, life goes on. As soon as when someone leaves, you know, it's, you know, it's like it's over. It's like, hey, next. And was Mad Dog Vachon around the AWA at all no, at that time? No, no. And you teamed with uh, Scott Hall and Kurt Hennig a bit in uh, the AWA. Yeah, uh, rode with them a little bit, and uh, that was when I got to know Scott Hall. And uh, um, Scott and Kurt were, were good friends, and they were a good tag team. They were a very good tag team, and uh, I got to six man with them or, or three man, you know, a triple with them. Was Scott always a partier even in those days? Or? No, it's the, the Scott. Quite the contrary, Scott was uh, you know eating tuna before the matches, and uh, he looked I mean, he looked fantastic. He looked 300 pounds, no waist, and just imagine Scott with no waist and you know just all muscle. So, and I guess when you first uh, were going to go over to Japan, originally it was going to be for uh, all Japan. Yeah, I had uh, I had started started out. I was told I was going from Europe and going home, and then they were gonna pick up my ticket and fly me over for a five-week tour in uh, with Baba. And really, you know, Nick Bockwinkle said, said Leon, yeah, this is a bad move. I mean, they, they got Stan Hansen, they got Bruiser Brody, they have, you know, you're gonna get buried on bottom in that opening match. And uh, instead, I debut against Antonio Noki, who, you know, had, had, uh, how did you end up going at, to there, though? Had star status above what Hogan Hogan was in America. Anoki was, you know, a greater star in Japan at this time than Hulk Hogan was in America. And I end up going in a single match with Anoki in a sold-out sumo palace and pinning him in two minutes. So you think about the, you know, what if I got buried on the bottom against, you know, because you're talking about Brody and Hanson and DiBiase and Race and Snuka, uh, you know, it just, and the list kept going. Steve Williams, I mean, it just kept going over there. So, you know, 
you know, he could have got buried under there for a long time. What was your reaction when uh, you found out that you were going over Antonio? Well, I didn't know until the very last minute. I was like, I just, you know, <laughs> just you, you just keep your mouth shut and, you know, get in the ring as quick as possible before they change their mind. Because that was, I mean, that's, I mean, has that ever happened to anyone in the history of professional wrestling? I mean, good Lord. And I understand there was a riot there. Uh, due to that, and you were actually well. See, he had, he was on about a nine-year winning streak, and uh, when I beat him in two minutes, they got pissed off legitimately, and they were rumbling and grumbling, and then they lit their they, they sit on pillows and they lit them on fire, and started throwing them at the ring at me, and wow, so it got pretty scary, and so they ran me out of the ring, and then they said, no, you you can't go to the locker room, because I was, I went to the locker room and got a cold. They have cold beer there. Match was over, so I grabbed a cold beer and sat down and, you know, started unlacing my boot. No, no, you have to leave. <laughs> you have to go. Because they, they were coming down the hallway, I guess. So. And I understand that New Japan was actually banned uh, from Sumo Hall for a while after that. Yeah, quite a while. And those fans are used to be, like, are normally quite reserved, particularly in those days. Well, yeah. Yeah, they disciplined, reserved. I've heard that Antonio, uh, on his status, there was almost like an emperor status. Uh, He's a senator now, and he's looked at with just amazing respect, married to a movie star. Would that be that? Would that be right? He's like bigger than a movie star almost there. Yeah, well, I mean, if you know, Hulk Hogan in his prime in America, I mean, he had movie star status, right? He was a movie star. Yeah. And uh, would yeah. you say he's at the level of The Rock? Yeah, yeah, probably more so. That's a good, a good analogy. More so on the level of The Rock what is today. And I understand that gimmick was also being considered for the Ultimate Warrior and Sid Vicious. Is there any reason why it went to you? Just you were better, obviously, more suited, but is there any other reasons why it didn't Well, I, I think that is a reason. That, uh, I mean, Sid obviously looks great, and Ultimate Warrior looks great. Uh, they're both tan and, and all muscled up. And, uh, I think I was, you know, I don't know. I think they were pulling away. You know, you have to say that Sid and the, and the Warrior both had that '80s look, and I was more of a, you know, you were more. You had more of the killer instinct than either of those. Well, guys. maybe, but uh, just my look alone. Yeah. I, I looked like a we're wrestler. Like a beast. I was 390 pounds and looked like a wrestler and um, better athletic and, ability. And, I guess. Yeah, and, and more athleticism. And and, and you know what. Not that they weren't athletes, but they were. They were very good players. athletes, but they they weren't NFL football players. And I think Anoki saw that. Um, and when you're talking about dealing with you know Fujinami and Anoki and, and Choshu and and uh, you know the list goes on of all the the smaller. You're talking about five foot ten, five foot eleven, six foot six foot one inch athletes that can scoot across that ring real quick. You know, sit at six eight and. The Ultimate Warrior was was somewhat limited, you know, athletically. So they probably would have ch had been challenged, you know, going 25, 20 minutes with these guys and putting on that classic match. That the, that uh, and, and it went with all those near falls. I mean, they, they started it was you know 15 minute finish. You know, they'd have they'd have a six seven minute match and should go right into the finish and go and 15. You probably minutes. couldn't really talk about it too much either because of the limited language abilities. Yeah, so yeah. You'd have to be able to prepared to do this on the fly, just hearing the finish from the referee. Yeah, yeah. Then that was hard because the referee comes big English. <laughs> and what's the, uh, you might not be able to talk about this too much, but they always talk about the uh, mafia connection to wrestling. In Japan. Yeah, I can talk about it. They, they were definitely there. And I don't think they owned the wrestling companies. The wrestling companies were owned by wrestling people. Maybe they had some people on the board, but more so they, I think they owned I think they owned the television company, but the television company had figureheads. You know, was this so and so was the president of, you know, and so and so was the vice president, and so and so was the marketing director, and the, you know, because when the, they walked in, these guys snapped too. Uh, and that was the real power of the television, and that was the real power of Japanese wrestling was the TV, because without that, you know, we're, you were rhythm dry.
Is it true that those guys would take uh, the top wrestlers out for dinner and stuff? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes? Yeah. Those are good stories, you know. Uh, wine and dine and food and and then you know it was like you'd be out with a, a group of these guys and you know they're they're all sitting around. They're used to being catered to, and they they would have waiters and you know waiting on them and waiting on us. And suddenly one of them would say, "Come here," you know, and he would you know whisper something in my ear. And, and then one one of them had said, "Well, we want you to serve all these guys drinks." You know, and I was supposed to be the world champion, and you know, big deal. But it wasn't beneath me to do it. I said, "Yes, sir." I mean, I knew where I was and what was going on, and that was his way of saying, "Hey, you, know, you guys are great, and we want you here, but you know, don't make a mistake." You know. And I hear that uh, Antonio and Oki would sometimes give you like treats in your. Uh hotel room after, like a massage, or <laughs> yeah. is that the kind of stuff they had? Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, you know, it was like... Not him giving the massage for Ben, no, he doesn't no, get this, no, but... Uh, no, he would send a girl over and, and you know, um, great massage and great company, but, you know, we would would do good business, and, you know, I'd be on top for, uh, and I think we sold out, I guess, t to just put a, we sold out from... The, my debut in the Sumo Palace for like two years after that, straight. So, I mean, business that 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 gimmick and that that helmet blowing smoke, you know, really turned things around. Speaking of that helmet blowing smoke, do you still have that? Yeah, yeah. It's in, in my basement. <laughs> the horn broke. Would you ever consider selling that if someone were to offer you the right price? Oh God, yeah. What fifty, seventy-five grand, probably. And uh, just one more thing back to the girls. I've heard of these Japanese like steam houses. What exactly are these bath houses? There's, there's bath houses, and you know what? Those are public bath houses, and pretty straightforward. Nothing, yeah. you know. They they, they serve they, alcohol. And yeah, you can. You know what? You can go in there and you can get a hot tub and a cold tub and a, an electric tub and a mud tub, and you can get a steam and a sauna. And then, you know, the neat thing about it is you would you can completely unclothe. And then you would shower. You would have this, you know, your soap, and you'd do your nails and your toenails, and you know, you'd really get clean and soap yourself from head to toe, and, and then you'd get in a steam bath, and then you'd get in a cold bath, and you, you know, you'd 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 really relieve yourself, and then you could wash again, and then you, you know, it was a very clean, clean atmosphere. So, you know, when you got out of there, you, and then you would do that for about an hour, so you were washing and, and sauna and hot tub and cold tubbing and, and then, you know, Mr. Mater's son, that, you know, a little girl would come over, you know, and she was going to massage you, so she'd take you back in the room and then massage you. And then after that massage, it was like you were done. It was, and, and I really think they, that they live longer, the men live longer, substantially longer. The North American males, the average lifespan is, I think, 68, 70, something like that. And uh, they're all living in, you know, um, I, I, you know, I, I haven't checked it lately, but it was like early 90s, late 80s, average. So I mean, it's substantially longer. And you ended up becoming the first uh, gaijin, for anyone who doesn't know, non-Japanese wrestler, to win the IWGP Championship in Japan, which is the highest title in Japan. Uh, what was that feeling like, winning that title? And do you want to just explain to people... Like how important that title is. Well, yeah, it, it's kind of a landmark title. I, I did the first uh, first non-Japanese to ever have it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an honor. I, I think even more of a distinction was um, I became the first wrestler. I mean, Japanese or American, and this is this is saying a lot because to ever win both. Baba's title and Anoki's title, all Japan and New Japan, having both, and I had one three times and the other one uh, two times. So, and then you know of of all the companies over there, all Japan, New Japan, NOAA, uh, and UWFI. So the four companies over there that I've worked for, I've got world titles in all four, and no one's ever done that either. So that that round robin there, that triple, is uh, you know. Let someone do that. Would you say that probably uh, of all time, 
other than maybe the old NWA title that like as of now the IWGP title is still probably the most important title. The WWE there there's there's a few of them now, but I think the WWE World Title, uh, you know, to me still still, I mean uh, the IWGP and the WWE right there together. But I mean the WWE is still pretty prestigious. And what was your uh, feud with Ricky Chosu like? That was a pretty uh, long one. Yeah, uh, Chosu was a good wrestler. You know, again that's uh, you know, he's short five eleven. And you know, very powerful guy, 270, and very, very quick. 270, 280, at 5'11, and uh, he, you know, was a great worker. He had a great sense of timing. So, but that's the kind of, I think, worker that the Warrior or, or uh, Sid would have maybe, you know, and who knows, maybe they would have tore it up with him too. So, but I'm just saying, athletically, I think that would have right. been more difficult for him. But as far as the talent goes between you and Sid and Moyer, you've had numerous five-star matches in your career, which is something that the, I, I don't think Sid can say you had a five-star match. I don't know. Um, the don't Warriors. Know my, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, Sid. I like Sid. Sid's He's a future Hall of Famer. A Warrior yeah. is a Hall of Famer. And, you know, hey, I'm not, so. Yeah. Recently, guys like Jim Ross and Steve Austin have said you're definitely a future WWE Hall of Famer. And Mick Foley, since this stuff has come out about your heart, has actually publicly said you should be in the Hall of Fame for 2017 in Orlando. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, going into the WWE Hall of Fame possibly? Certainly you have the credentials, not only uh, for all your accomplishments in Japan and WCW, but you had a pretty decent WWE career main eventing and pay-per-views and on Raw. Um, so what are your thoughts on the WWE Hall of Fame? You know, the one thing I'm not ashamed about is my wrestling career. Uh, and I shouldn't say that the one thing. I'm very proud of my football career. I'm very, very proud of my wrestling career. And, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. We talked about this earlier. I had always thought of myself as Leon White, the football player, the, the, the high school All-American, the uh, college All-American, the, the guy that played in the Super Bowl. And, and actually, I have a ring on now. You know what? I'm going to show it off. You can see that right there. So, I don't know if he's zooming in on this. That's the Super Bowl, and then this is my uh, name and number. And then the front is the bowl, and it just says we were NFC champions, LA Rams. So, there you go. It's a pretty ring. It's 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 old school ring. It's not the, the big gaudy ones. Uh, they're bigger than guys' hands. I kind of like this one because you could actually wear it. The other ones aren't really meant to wear. They're they're just keepsakes you you bring out uh, at dinner or something like that. But um, but you feel a WWE Hall of Fame ring would be a good match to that one. I, you know what? I think it's 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 I think it's premature for me to comment. I I have hopes. I hopes and every wrestler uh, in America would want to be in the WWE Hall of Fame. It's an extremely, I was going to say very, it's an extremely prestigious uh, honor to be given. But I, I just, you know, I can't I can't say anything right now. But as I far mean, as... I, I hope, I hope, and I have dreams. As too. far as you're aware, you're on good terms with the company. I think so, yeah. Your popularity in Japan at its peak, I understand you were in television ads. Uh, you want to just talk us about your uh, how big you were there? Yeah, I was doing commercials and... Uh, uh, personal appearances were, were, you know, the money was good. Uh, they really paid for personal appearances where you come to their place and sign some autographs and, you know, shake hands and things like that. So, um, the, the, I, I got paid uh, a lot of money, like over over 50K for uh, a Sony commercial. And it was uh, a dodecahorn. And it was a, a squawk box that I had... Uh, you know, Sony commercial in Japan is pretty big. What was it like being out in public around that time in Japan? I don't know. I, I, I enjoyed my time in Japan. I, I once you get used to the environment and you, you know, you get used to the schedule. Um, great place to work and, and make money. So, it was it was a it was a great opportunity for me and a, a great honor to go over there and work.
Maybe the match you're best known for now with YouTube and how easy it is to look up stuff in Japan is your infamous match with Stan Hansen yeah. that was part of an All Japan Pro Wrestling versus New Japan Pro Wrestling Super Card. And what are your thoughts on that crazy match? Well, it was a... Yeah, it was a Super Card, 90-some thousand people. But uh, we were one of the main events, and Stan and I. And Stan was just huge in Japan. He, he like Anoki, shared a special place in Japan, especially after uh, uh, Brody had, had passed. And uh, and I, I think you know when Brody passed, they, they realized, you know, it was even even my status you know grew substantially, along with stands, and, and so we were finally put together. Probably what would have been Brody and him, you know, was now me and him, and uh, it was a great honor because it was the top two, two spots, and you know for Americans, you know, in that that time in that culture in Japan, without question, and so. You know, we, we got we got after it pretty good, hot and heavy, and you know, somehow Stan's thumb got in my eye, and <laughs> I'm not gonna say, you know, I I don't know. He says it was an accident, and I, I'm taking him as his word, but you know, uh, it did pretty serious damage to you. Right? Yeah, oh yeah, it. I lost. It obviously, it popped out of your head. Yeah, it popped out of my head. I had to shove it back in, but I had to. Uh, I lost vision, lost like half the vision, and then uh, the the eye it, itself, when it pushed back in, it uh, the cord had stretched, so they had to take it back out, and then a subsequent surgery, and cut the cord and reattach the cord because the cord was too long. So in other words, my eye would look left, this side would look left, but this one would stay straight ahead, so my eye was lagging, and. Uh, and then um, all the bones in, in my face had to be fused. So I mean, my whole, all my cheekbone was broken. All this was broken. My whole nose, nose was crushed. So this nostril had to be rebuilt with steel. And then the, the, my, up here, my eyebrow was, was cracked, had to be fused. And so pretty extensive surgery. And, and yeah, it was pretty painful to you know shove it back in and keep wrestling because you know he. He kept hitting it, but that was, you know, it, it obviously it just kept getting hit during the course of the match. Were you tempted to lose your temper in that match? Or just yeah, I mean, it came close a few times. You just, like, hey, this ain't right. And, you know, however, whatever he could possibly do, he couldn't justify, you know, thumbing me in the eye and, and doing that kind of damage. So anything I would have done if I hadn't, you know, kept myself as a professional, uh, certainly I think would have been justified. I, I think everyone would have said, hey, I mean, how, how can you blame him? Shit, he just got his eye knocked out. Did it ever cross your head to stop the match when that eye first Yeah, out? at first, at the very first, I, I didn't know if it was going to... I remember I took off the mask and I was walking around the circle with my left hand keeping him off me and touching it seeing if, you know, how bad. Because it, it, when I shoved it back in, it didn't go all the way back in. It was substantially protruded if you look at it. It was, it was like, this is here. It was probably half an eyeball out, but it was kind of half in the socket. So that worried me. I thought if it pops back out, I'll lose it, you know. But what happened was the swelling had swelled over it, even though it wasn't sunk back in, and was holding it in place. And so I, I felt it, and it felt pretty firm because that swelling was so tight. I thought, well, shit, I'll try it. And so you just, you, just, you grin and bear it, man. How much did it cost you to get it all fixed? Quite a bit. Uh, Shoot, about half that paycheck. Teaming with Bam Bam Bigelow, what are your memories of? Bam Bam was great. I mean, he, him and I kind of butted heads. You know, we, we toured, uh, when we formed a tag team, we became tag champs uh, for Noki. Um, you know, we, we seemed to sense that, hey, we were good together. And we complimented each other and we knew how to, we knew how to feed each other. Uh, so I think for that sake we, we got along better, but you know for the most part I don't think he liked me. And uh, he claims that he groomed you, and he claimed <laughs> well he's passed away now, but he said this on a shoot interview that you had redhead syndrome. What he described, uh, I don't know, but you know it's like I'm getting what what it, what it, 
Would it kill call me? How many different things? <laughs> God. I mean, I'm a flake on this, on that. You know, I'm a college-educated man, and I. Um, someone said I was bipolar, and that's like, you know, I'm actually thinking Vader's a real character, right? Yeah. Leon, there's Leon, and then there's Vader. And this is just crazy. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from the dead, he's getting me. <laughs> from, from beyond. Well, the shoot interviews stay up forever, so. Uh, I guess uh, what did he die of? I mean. Heart, it was heart related, I guess, from what I understand. Um, speaking of people that passed away, did you have much contact with Steve Williams, Dr. Death, in Japan? Yeah, we were, we were pretty close. Um, you know, I heard he, he fought a real courageous battle. And he really wanted to live. He was, he had, you know, he was a very, I don't know, you know, he was full of life. He had dark skin and he had all this, this energy and power. And, uh, it was a shame to see him go. And WCW had a working relationship with New Japan in the early 90s. Is that how you got brought into WCW from their connection with Japan? No, I think I, I, think I created that relationship. I was like the first one. Okay. And, uh, would it have been Jim Ross? I had initially contacted Jim Ross, and Jim said, you know, he would give me some shots at X amount per, per shot, and that's what I was just, uh, I was initially working for New Japan full-time, and when I came home, I would, you know, they would know I was c coming home, and they'd say, okay, we got this trip home, we got 15 dates for you, you know, and this trip home, we have so many dates for you, so that's how they booked it, but it's, it's all started with Jim Ross, and then of course, Dusty, and, uh, was Bill Watts head of WCW at that time? Yeah, he was. At some point he was. I, I don't know if he was initially. So, Would it have been Jim Hurd initially? Yeah, Jim Hurd initially. Did you get along well with him? Ric Flair always uh, puts Jim Hurd down, but I've heard other people say I, You know, I, I I didn't have any dealings with him, so it was just I was coming in and out. You know, for I was a, I wasn't a salaried. Uh, I was just making so much a shot. Bill Watts seems like the type of guy that would have liked a wrestler like you. Did you guys? He did. I never had no trouble with him. We, uh, he let me do my thing, and you know I was drawing, so he just let me go. I guess Eric Bischoff would have been announced an announcer when you first came to WCW. Yeah, and uh, Eric, you know, initially didn't know much about wrestling, and I think he's probably the first to admit it. But he learned pretty quick, you know. He never really has much good things to say about you. Was there any heat? Eric, yeah, we we had heat. I was trying to be nice, you know, uh, previously, but yeah, we we had heat. Uh, I think uh, at some point uh, I, you know, he was making wrestling decisions and and you know, I questioned him, and so. What I always find personally funny about Eric Bischoff is I think WCW only profited for about one or two years while he was in control of WCW and he's always talked about sometimes as a genius for creating the NWO but the company never really had long-term profit. Kevin Nash created NWO. Kevin Nash, that, that was Kevin Nash's brainchild. He, yeah, that's, Shawn Michaels got up at the Hall of Fame banquet, and, you know. Oh, because you were at the Hall of Fame banquet yeah, last year. Yeah, and Kevin, Kevin was being inducted, and Kevin Nash created the NWO. It's, it, you know, as far as I know, but it wasn't Eric. And you were paired with Harley Race, the legendary wrestler who we, we've also interviewed as your manager. Uh, what was that like being paired with such a interesting guy? Well, for me, obviously, it was somebody that you respected, and uh, somebody that you know had been there, done it, and I, I felt honored to to be with him. And, and when you wanted a spot, you know, Harley, what about this situation? What would be, you know, this is what I have, you know, can you come up with something better? And nine times out of ten, he would come up with something better. So he was, you know, we would ride together in the car, and uh, we would, you know, it just, you know, we would, he would never tell me anything in construct. He would never criticize me, ever in front of anybody. But we'd get down the road driving, you know. Harley loved to drive fast, and he'd you know 120 miles an hour down the big wide Atlanta roads, and 
uh, he would say, you know, what made you do this instead of this in this position or in this situation? And, you know, that type of teaching, that comparative shopping type thing, you know, you know I did this, but you're saying I could have done this. Oh, I see how that could have worked better. It would have fit into the next thing. And so it, it starts getting, this is where wrestling becomes beyond. In other words, people say, well, you know, wrestling's uh, fake, wrestling's entertainment, wrestling's this. And, and you know, when you get on the level that, that Harley's at, a guy like Harley Race is at, you know, this 50-year wrestler, uh, Hall of Famer that, you know, understands the game and the ability to tell a story with your body physically. Um, it's where it gets very, very hard to do, hard to duplicate. And you had a famous feud with Sting that went on a long time. You had some yeah. great matches with Sting. Uh, what are your memories of working with him? I don't know. I would say it's one of the better feuds in, in wrestling history. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of great feuds. I'm not saying it was the best or the top, but I think it would rank up there amongst the top, uh, certainly. And it's just we never had a bad match, ever. And just It was just like gold with him. I mean, he knew how to sell, you know, for me, and he knew how to come back, and he knew what I wanted to sell for, so we got to know each other very good. Would you consider him your favorite opponent? Um, or up there? I, yeah, I, I don't... I think I have a favorite, you know, because there were so many in Japan and, you know, so many in the WWE and, uh, and then Cactus Jack. I mean, Mick, Mick and I, we had, we had a great feud, you know, uh, Ric Flair and I. I mean, it, it, we did a lot of good business at WCW. And there's an infamous uh, vignette, the White Castle of Fear vignette, that's pretty popular on the internet nowadays. <laughs> Uh, what were your, your thoughts on making those uh, WCW videos? Well, Sting hated it. He hates it today. He said, oh, God, he was embarrassed to do it. And I thought it was kind of cute, corny, but cute, you know, yeah. the White Castle of Fear. And then my fond memory of it is that my son, you know, when the helicopter was flying over, when Sting was coming to the White Castle of Fear, <laughs> my son was seven, six, seven years old, and he says, Papa, Papa, wh where's my bedroom in there? How come, I, how come you haven't told me about, you know, we have this new... <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was almost in tears. And I, I get a kick out. I laugh. I laugh very hard when I think about that because he was saying, no, that's a great place. Where's my bedroom? You know, how come I... He was pissed that he hadn't seen it. He wanted know? to live in the White Castle if you... Yeah, it's so the, the White House, right? So he wanted to know. That was great. And you had a feud with Nikita Koloff that he ended up getting injured from. Uh, what was that all about? You know what? Let's just shed the light on this. Nikita wasn't hurt. Nikita had an insurance uh, policy, and he collected. Oh, he was I, one of the blades of uh, London where Ted DiBiase took that, I think, too. Kurt Henning took it for a while. I think Animal. A lot of people were covered by that. Yep. So you, but that's that's the inside story on that one. I, that's, yeah, I mean, that's my opinion. I didn't hurt him, but he collected, <laughs> and he's and he's now a minister, so he found his calling. It took, what, how many, $3 million, and he found his calling. And you know what, more power to him. I mean, he's a good guy. Why not? Why couldn't he collect? And you were part of a historic match uh, when you were WCW world champion. Ron Simmons won the world title from you to become the first black world champion. You know, take that aside for just a minute. That match was a heck of a match. It was only about 13 minutes, but man, it was just perfect, perfectly placed. See, Ron didn't like to wrestle long, so I knew I had to come up with something short and sweet. And uh, man, it was just it popped. I mean, have you, have you watched it? Yeah. Yeah, it was just... At the time when I was young. When he pinned me, uh, my God, the people just, I've never heard a pop that loud, ever. Ever. And I've heard, I've heard some loud pops in Japan. Do you think they should have given him a longer run with the title? Well, he was hurt. Not so, I mean, I took the belt back just a couple months or, no, five or six, seven months later. I don't know. It wasn't that long. Six months. But, uh... But he was hurt a lot of that time. Yeah. And Jake Roberts was around WCW at that time. Uh, any memories of, of him being around WCW? Jake Jake was a troubled person at that time. He was, you know, 
he was making his shots and and, and, and wrestling, making appearances. But uh, he was a troubled person. And I think you know Diamond Dallas Page is is uh, yeah something I want to say is that Diamond has offered to help me with my problem, and we're uh, we're gonna first you know attack what what I eat, see if I can get more nutrients, more health out of my food, and then obviously uh, as far as calorie intake and and the goal is to drop 100 pounds with him. So, I mean, he, I don't know, he seems to have knowledge and, and he chooses to to give this knowledge as a gift. And, you know, he certainly helped Jake out, saved Jake's life and he saved Scott's life, without question. And uh, I was around them both, not a lot, but just, you know, sporadically at this show or that show. And, uh, you know, they, they really needed an intervention and he came. So, he, you know, hey, you know, there's hope. <laughs> and did you ever wrestle DDP at any time? Or do you avoid it? Uh, no, but I remember him starting out. DDP was, uh, you know, tall, really tall, 6'5", and, and uh, lanky. Yeah. And uh, I just seen this guy over in the corner, and he was setting up this recorder, much like the one right here. And I said, what are you doing, man? He, I said, I see you doing this every night. He said, well, I record every one of my matches. And I go home that night while I was fresh and watch him. And, you know, Diamond was a terrible wrestler when he first started. He had no clue. He came, came from the street and had no, you know, really probably not a whole lot of athletic background, maybe in high school, I don't know. But, man, he became a really good wrestler in a short period of time uh, with, you know, probably above average athleticism, but not great. You know, not like a Sting or Shawn Michaels or Ric Flair. And... Uh, and he, he got a whole lot of mileage out of his career. And you mentioned your health problems. Uh, you were recently in a car accident that was pretty serious. Do uh, you want you to know, tell us about that? I had a rollover car accident. I was, I was in my uh, company car and uh, was actually coming back from Costco. And there was uh, a series of, of turns. And I caught a turn to... to too late and overturned coming back and it actually rolled. I rolled I rolled the car twice and uh, the whole top of the car was caved in where my head was and my head looked like it. My my eyes were black and blue, my nose was, was swollen, my forehead was swollen, my head was probably close to twice the, the normal size. And, um, is that what the mark is on your head there? Yeah, but it's just, you know, just superficial at this point. It probably should have died in that accident and it was just probably weeks, just literally th two or three or four weeks prior to that accident, I uh, was seeing a doctor and uh, I was in a medical center and I was seeing my doctor, which who was an MD, and a heart specialist came in my room and said, Liam, we've been looking at your heart. And I said, well, you know, who are you? I, I hadn't re didn't recognize the guy. And I, I won't name him uh, at this point, but uh, he said, Liam, you have two years to live. And we've been looking at your heart and uh, that's the deal. So, you know, he kind of, <laughs> it wasn't much longer than that that he he came in the room, he said that, and he left. And obviously I had a thousand questions, and and uh, I, I'm i in the process of answering those questions at this point. So for me to, to start talking, you know, would probably be premature at this point. But, uh, you know, I've been in the gym. I feel okay. I mean, I, I, uh, I feel pretty good actually, so I, I don't know exactly what he's talking about or if something will will show itself up in, in, in weeks to come, but you know, right now I, I'm still trying to figure out exactly uh, what's going on. So. Are you still going to be wrestling? Yeah, I'm, uh, I've got bookings now and uh, I'm in the gym preparing for those bookings, uh, autograph sessions, wrestling matches, and uh, maybe I can get a match with Kale. If, do you think that would be fair <laughs> if I if I stuck his head in through the middle of the ring? I understand <laughs> that uh, you're going to be going to go, go into, uh, Atlanta to uh, yeah. You know what? In in lieu of all all of everything that's going on, um, Diamond Dallas Page contacted me, and uh, if if you're looking for a better guy, you won't find it. Diamond Dallas Page he has he has a gift to give and he has a need to give it and. Uh, he he called me up and said, Liana, you know, I heard about your problems and your health problems, and uh, we uh, 
we want to help. And you offer to come down. So January 2nd, I'm going to be in Atlanta and start working with Diamond. And we're, we're going to get after it. The goal is to lose 100 pounds. So as I sit right now, I am... I'm probably uh, about 375, 380, so uh, I don't think I'm fat, but I'm big, and I've been in the gym lifting and doing a lot of cardio, you know, 45 minutes an hour a day, walking and then, then getting off the bike and then uh, doing a 20-minute walk and, uh, and then going to work out, so... Um, I, I have you still have an appetite. Huh? You still have your appetite. You know what, I do, and it, it's... it's it's, I'm supposed to be losing weight, and my suddenly, in lieu of all of this news and and uh, the gloom and doom and, and everything that's going on, it's like my appetite has increased. And man, I just I just keep eating and eating, and that's why I'm working out more because I have to trans, you know, you know, <laughs> take all that food into something positive. So. And also, you're not on any specific heart medications now, so maybe if you get on some heart medications, combined with the weight loss, your your chances of living longer would increase. Uh, you know, I, I can't comment right now about that, but I, I, I do know this, that uh, I've had a number, I've had three different doctors in Boulder, you know, express the gloom and doom scenario. And, uh, you know, so it's it's the top of the second, if, we, if we're talking about baseball, and uh, I'm behind. So I'm, uh, my, my son uh, has reached out and we're going to, we're going to go down, I'm going to go down, he lives in Dallas, and we're going to go down to Dallas, and uh, I'm going to go to Dallas and see the doctors in Plano, and my understanding is that the Plano heart doctors are the renowned heart surgeons, heart specialists in the United States, and, and perhaps the world, so uh, I've got appointments down there, and then I'm off to see Dallas, so I'm not, uh, I'm not sitting on this, I'm, I'm proactive, uh, I'm just just refusing to die. I'm not going to die. And uh, that's the mindset I have and the mindset I, I will have uh, forevermore. So. And another incident maybe you could shed some light on is uh, you had a match with a jobber in WCW, Joe Thurman, and according to reports, he ended up breaking his back. In the and you know what? We, we went to the hospital that night and he was hurt and he had a, he had a just brain back, but it wasn't broke. I mean, and I said, can you stand up right now? I mean, you're laying here on this gurney. And because uh, I said, Harley, I have to go. I mean, I, I power bombed him like I power bombed anyone else. And uh, that's what they asked me to do. And I felt terrible. I said, I, you know, because, uh, you know, we, that's what we do. We take care of each other. We don't, you know, the goal, you know, you know, maybe to rough someone up or, spud someone, but you know, you don't hurt someone. So Joe, he stood up, he stood up and said, you know, I don't know anything but if the broken back could stand up. He stood up and said it hurt, but, you know, and he sat back down, but, uh, you know, it made me feel better. I, you know, I got back on the road. I, if you stand, you know, this soon afterwards, you're probably not broke. You know, I, I heard it broke. I said, this guy's crippled. You know, he's laying there. He can't move his legs. He broke back. And, it wasn't, and that's what people hear. And the fans, they he broke his back. Well, I did break his back because he was standing and talking to me, you know, just an hour after the match in the hospital, in the emergency ward. Was there a legal situation with him in WCW regarding that? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. And they didn't, they didn't tell me. And you worked with Davey Boy Smith a uh, bit in WCW. Any memories of that? Yeah, Davey Boy was great. We, see, there's another one. I mean, uh, Sting and Davey Boy and... and and Mick and Flair, Hogan, I mean, very, very productive time. Why was his run in WCW so short? Who? Uh, Davey Boyce, because it seemed like it was only a brief feud that you guys had, then he was gone. Um, you know, I never looked at it like that. I, you know, I mean, there's only one match that could be the main event match, and yeah. usually that was, you know. That was fresh off of his Wembley Stadium match. And yeah. He was pretty popular at that time. I mean, between, you know, I had my fair share of main events, and Hogan had his, and Flair had his, and Sting had his, and oftentimes together, you know, but you know, Davey Boy was maybe the semi-main event, but he, he was contributing in a big way. And your feud with Cactus Jack, that's another big one that you're known for. Uh, 
What are your thoughts on uh, that brutal WCW Saturday night match you had with him? <laughs> you know, Mick is, he's got to be the most courageous man I've ever, ever met. Uh, good friend. He's came out publicly for me and recently, and I love him to death. But he, uh, you know, the, the, the bumps he took with The Undertaker on the cage is just, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, for me to sit here and say that it's off the chart, it's like from a 1 to 10, it's a 12. It doesn't even do those bumps justice. It's a 20. For him to take that bump off the top rope. You know the one bump where he he was on the corner of the cage and Undertaker threw him off? And he just kind of, off of one leg off the top of that cage, he he rotated and landed kind of on his shoulder and back. Well, what if he had rotated just a little bit, nosedived? Yeah. You know, and he hits his shoulder, and but he hits his head. At the same time, he's dead. And... So it wasn't just the fact that he took those bumps. I mean, probably some good athleticism the reason he's alive. And then the one through the cage, one straight down through. And, you know, he's, my God, he's, anyone, and let me get to me real quick. But the one, I remember he had a tooth, one well, tooth had fell out and was in his nose. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, Really, things we did. I mean, I power bombed him on the cement, and I'm telling you, I, I, he was a big dude at this time. He, you know, he's lost some weight. He's lost hundred pounds. Yeah. And that's kind of. Why you know, doing it? Yeah. Well, he he did it, you know, through Diamond, to, through Dallas, Page, Diamond Dallas Page, and uh, he went down there and got some advice, and I started out with him, and then you know, went on his own because you know you can't just you can't stay down there for six months in his house. So you know you have to you know you, you get started with him and then you go away and you have to do it on your own, but uh, certainly D Diamond is the catalyst of, of that, and he looks great. You saw him on Monday Night Raw just the other night, but uh, I mean I power bombed him. He was probably 350 pounds, and I knew he'd be a load. So I mean I really grunted and I got him up pretty high, and man he splatted on that cement. I, but looking back, you go, well, you know, all that just, even a power bomb on the cement, tells by comparison from taking that bump off the top. It's like, so. And what was your reaction when he lost his ear in that match? That wasn't anything to do with your fault. His ear was caught in the cables. But well, you know, it was caught in the cables and it was tore off. And my hand did rip it off, and finally, but it was, I think it was partially torn, and you know, I tore it off the rest of the way. That, that, I think that'd be fair to say. Um, you know, at first I was shocked, and then I thought, you know, hell, Mick <laughs> Foley, did, he didn't blink an eye. So I'm, you know, I'm like, shit. You know, is he gonna stop, or what are we gonna do? He just lost his ear. And <laughs> the funny part was, uh, Mick's going, you know, hit me, man, hit me. So his ear was bleeding. So you know, my clubs that I, you know, those big clubs I use. So I hit him, man. It, it just whatever was left out there just flew. So I hit it, man. It just. Rest of it, there's a little chunk left on there, and it just flew off, and uh, blood everywhere. And the ref went over. He saw where the, the the initial part of the ear fell off, and he went and <laughs> grabbed it. He came over to the both of us. Goes, it's, here's your ear, Foley. <laughs> I think I kicked the ref in the stomach and said, "Drop it. We'll get it later." God, we're in the middle of a match. What do you want us to do with that damn tear? <laughs> we should have stopped the match and went, oh, God, that's interesting. Uh, I'm getting tired. I said, some punch truck. And you were tag team partners with Sid in WCW at the time of uh, his crazy fight with Arn Anderson. Yeah, you know what? It was a, it was a pretty good tag team. We, we drew. The masters of the power bombs. We drew. You know, the crowd were jam-packed, and we were in main event, and we drew. And main event, the... Beach Blast, I guess, the pay rate was pretty good. I think it was a 2-0. There's another uh, vignette for that one, too. Yeah. <laughs> With the midget blowing up the boat. Oh, yeah, and we were walking. See, I got sunburned that day, because I had, man, it's a hot day, and I, you know, I'm, I'm redheaded, so I got sunburned, but, oh, God. So were you around uh, when that fight occurred with uh, Sid and Anderson? And yeah, you? tell you what, um, here, here, real quick, I'll give you the chronology on this. We had worked all week, uh, two weeks, 
two weeks hard, three weeks hard. And then we were supposed to, you know, after three weeks of hard work and you're tired, we're supposed to meet in the, uh, at five o'clock in the afternoon, meet at the airport in Florida at this, this one terminal, private for us, right? And so they've got all the drinks, they're all, all loaded. So we're all there and we're all beat up. So, you know, I've been three weeks on the road and I'm beat up. So I'm taking a couple of pain pills, getting ready to get on this long plane ride over to the deal. And, uh, you know, I was riding first class. So, you know, I wasn't too much, I wasn't worried too much. But, so we, but you take pain pills, you know, and then you take a couple muscle relaxers, and then you take volumes, and not too many, but just enough to relax you, because that plane ride, your legs get tight, and, and you can, can't stand up after a while, you know. Your back hurts, and it's like, you know, but those, you know, they just kind of keep you, they kind of keep you loose. And, and if you overdo them, well, then you're an idiot, but if you don't, they could be a very helpful tool. That's the reason you're created. Yeah, but, you know, if you, you overuse them and you're throwing up and, uh, you know, it's just, just crazy. So, we're, uh, this plane ride over there was just, just crazy. And then we land. So now we're talking about three weeks of work and then the plane ride, the, oh, and then the, the party at the terminal and then the plane ride, right? And then we get there and the sun's coming up. And, okay, guys, get on the bus, drove three hours, and wrestled. Wait, wait a minute, we're not going to a hotel and sleep? Because that blew me away after that, all that, you know. That's a long time. And ago. then wrestled, and then got on the bus again and drove another to the next town. four hours to the next town. Didn't stay in that town. I thought, well, we'll wrestle, you know, and everyone get off the bus, and then... We'll wrestle and then go to a hotel and, you know, sleep it off and travel the next day. No, that night, and that was it. So, we, we finally got there and it was sun up and, uh... There was drinking on the bus, I'll assume. Oh, yeah. Just tons of it. Tons of it. And then, uh... So we get there and... I, God, I can't remember. It was, it was... Either Stone Cold was in the bar by himself, you know. And I, I, I think he was. And I, yeah, I was, at, I was, I opened my door. I had a ground floor room, and I opened my door, and I had these big white boxers on. And, <laughs> and, and I see, well, that sucker's over there drinking. How did he get to bar? Because we didn't think the bar could be open. Somehow Stone got, Stone Cold got it open. And, uh, and this was before Stone Cold run, you know. So yeah. I said, how did he do that? So. <laughs> I, I put on my tennis shoes, so I had these boxers. Imagine a foreign pound guy in white boxers yeah. and tennis shoes, no socks, and no shirt. <laughs> and I come walking over there, and Stone Cold just starts laughing. He says, well, have a beer, Leon. You look like you need one. I said, sure do. So we started drinking and talking. You know, and it was, this was a really nice hotel, but there was no one there. And so I'm in my boxers at the bar. And they, Stone Cold tells the story. It's funny as shit. Here's Leon sitting at this five-star bar in Europe, and he's, <laughs> he's <laughs> and we're just like oblivious. I mean, you're oblivious because you just you're you're numb. Yeah. I mean, you know, three weeks on the road is care. murder, and then it just kept going and kept going and kept going, and finally they pushed us, you know, till it popped, and suddenly Stone Cold and I, we hear this, what's over there? My God, they're fighting. That's Arn and Sid. And we didn't move. We didn't move. We, didn't. we, we had our beer in us. Shoot, they're, 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 man, that's serious. We did not move, no help or nothing. It was just like, didn't ever cross us. We were so tired and yeah. intoxicated. It's like, you know, I can't get over there. Shoot, I don't know if I could get over there alone. What I'd do when I got there? You're in your boxers. Yeah. Anyways. I'd go back <laughs> in my, i get beat up or, or, or shoot, cause more trouble. So, uh, next thing I know, Sid comes walking over and he's doing Frankenstein walk. So, so he's, he's literally, I mean, he's Frankenstein. I thought, I said, Sid, what's wrong with you? He was my partner, so I got up off the stool. And then I looked closer and I said, man, he had a hole in his stomach right here. And about, about my thumb. And that's where they had been stabbed with those scissors because you figure both scissors, you know, because he came to Arm's room or something, and Arn had a pair of scissors in the room or something. No, no, I didn't see it, so I can't comment. It's one yeah. great. All I saw was Sid coming over. 
so I can't comment on nothing that. But so every time Sid's heart beat, I mean about a nickel size, uh, my side of my finger would pump out blood, and uh, wow, it's like he's gonna die because there's. I mean, he was in, wasn't just bleeding; it was, it was like a fountain. I mean, yeah. Sid had a big, strong heart, and it come. You know, and then I noticed it was getting a little less. The blood pressure was, you know, he was yeah. dying. And he said, he said, Leon, I, I said, sit, sit down. And I stuck my thumb in the hole, literally stuck my thumb in the hole. And just, I said, I'm going to push a little bit. And I got it in there and it actually quit bleeding. I mean, a little was trickling out. And I said, don't move, man. And I said, I started yelling. I said, somebody get an ambulance and Sid's going to die. And well, they were scrambling. And, Everyone's now coming, and they said, Leon, don't move, your thumb's got it stopped. And the ambulance driver came and said, We got it now, and he pulled my thumb out. And said, eh. You know what? Neither Arn or Sid thanked me because, and I don't expect them to, but I'm just kind of being facetious here. Because um, if Sid had died, Arn would have, that's basically, yeah. Yeah, and, and Sid died as well as he did, so, and. Yeah, I think he would have. I think he would have bled to death. And there's, because there was, when I took my thumb, it was 15 more minutes, and there's no way he would have bled that much. By the time he got to me, he was already passing out. So he was ready to go out, and I stopped it, and I kept to just breathe, keep breathing, don't pass out, said, don't pass out. He was looking up in the air, he was sitting down, but I had him sitting down. So, you know, I think maybe I saved his life, but never once, hey, Leon, thanks for sticking your thumb in my that was quick thinking, you know. Not not even just, not even a, a hoot. And last time I talked to Sid, he told me he wasn't drinking anymore, so I guess that's probably a good reason why not. Hey, <laughs> join the club, never mind. Were you there for the uh, Brian Pillman incident with Sid, with the squeegee? No. No. I heard about it, but I don't think I saw that. Did you get along well with Pillman? Yeah, Brian. Yeah. So you had a very famous Starcade match with... Uh, Rick Flair that he talks about in his book and alleges that you were a little stiff with him in that match. Uh, mm -hmm. But what are your memories of that match and just working was, with Flair? And I Jim? believe it was 34 minutes and it was a five-star match. Uh, the other five-star match I was Muda in Japan. Flair, I mean, you, you don't have many five-star matches and uh, that's one I'm very proud of. But the thing with Rick was for me to be me. Now I could go out there and have, you know, a two-star, two-and-a-half, three-star match with Rick. But to get the five star out of Rick, you had to piss him off and you had to challenge him. And see, I've told Rick this and he keeps telling that same sad story that I was did this and then he beat me up and blackened my eyes. Have you heard that? Yeah, in his book. Yeah, well, it. yeah. He, they, well, I, yeah, I blacked him. And you backed off after he. he yeah, in other words, I, I challenged him in the ring and then he fired up and started punching me. And uh, he's punching, closed my eyes. The next day, my eyes were closed, which is, you know, they were a little puffy, but it's just bullshit. And uh, and then I backed off, and he, you know, he basically dominated. And the thing was, I told Rick to his face in a bar. I said, Rick, come on, you, you, know, you keep telling that same sad story about how you puff my eyes. And I said, H how is it that you can puff my eyes up if I let you? Because I got down one knee, I put my hand around your waist and fed you. Like, come on, hit me. I put one knee and just looked up at him like that. And the reason was because I told Harley, I said, I want to. I mean, we're going to town. We're going to put Charlotte, and it was supposed to be me and someone else, but Rick was a replacement. So you don't put a replacement in the job. In. And so you I. You and Sid, actually, I think. I think right. it was me and Sid, yeah, supposedly. But the Anderson thing happened? Yeah, the Anderson thing happened, and Sid was gone. Mm -hmm. So, but, so, you know, Rick's in his hometown. You know, you can't beat him there. It's just, it's Big Baby Fist. It would have, it would have really. It wouldn't have been right, I don't think. I don't think I would have been, in, I wouldn't have done a job in my hometown, in Denver, you know. So, we do the 34 minutes, and I had told Harley, you know what, the only way I can get this this four-star, five-star match, and I didn't use those terms, but the best match out of Rick is if I piss him off. And I'm going to, you know, for the first, I, I, he, he said, what are you going to do? And I said, for the first 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to stuff him. I mean, I'm, every time he looks like he wants to do something, I'm going to nail him. And boy, I did. And he was getting dejected. And I kept nailing him, kept nailing him. And it was like nothing. But I knew we had the time, so it was like I heard 15 minutes. And I said, okay, Rick, block. 
And you know, you talk about Ric Flair and he hears okay, you know, from a 400 pound hill, he's ready because, you know, he knows he's behind. And man, he, he, lets, he lights me up. But it was time, it was a match, it was by design. But I said, bleep, bleep, it's your time, take, take it. And boy, he did, he was lighting me up and I was feeding him my face. I Rick threw great punches and he would mainly hit me there, but a couple were to the eye. And he did, you know, puff my eyes up. But, uh, you know, so it was designed by me. And what you hear on the, the what, uh, YouTube stuff is, you know, something entirely different. But I, I credit Rick, I mean, you know, for f taking a, taking an ass whooping for the first 15 minutes by design on my part. And, you know, you do that to some people and they don't come back, you know. Rick's a champion and he just, he, he saw his opportunity. He, man, he fought like heck. And boy, that match, that last 15 minutes was, and when he pinned me, they went nuts. But it was like, you know, we needed that 15 minutes of just, not, you, know, you could have dropped a pin. That sold out Charlotte. And that was designed by me. So, you know, there's once again, it was, it was a pretty good call on my part. Actually a great call on my part and, you know, and supposedly there was something on uh, Twitter with you guys lately. I didn't. I actually didn't follow it on Twitter, but I heard Ric Flair say that there was something, some type of an argument. But you guys actually t called each other, and now it's sorted out. Yeah, we sorted it out. You know, it's just, it, you know, I I was listening to this stuff about how he had blacked my eyes and he beat me up, and so I tweeted something about it, and you know, in 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 response, I said, well, you know, well, that wasn't the case, and and. Uh, Blah blah blah, and then so he responded to me, and so we got into it a little bit. But uh, all in all, you know, Rick's a pretty good guy. He really is. He's actually he's a very good guy. And uh, if he's if he likes you, he's on your side. You have a real ally, and I I've never had a problem with him. I don't know what he feels about me at this point, but uh, I know. You said you were all cool. The last thing I heard. So you know what? Uh, I like Rick, and you know I love working with him because. Man, what a baby face. Good Lord. Jeez. I mean, she had baby faces like that, and, you know. Wow. And how did things change when Hogan came into the company? Well, just the dynamics, you know. He came in and beat Flair four straight. Now, come on. That's like, you know, Flair was, he just, Flair just beat me two, you know, and then two straight. And then it just, it just changed. And I don't know if that was them or him, and, you know. He was, I mean, Sting was making so much money, I was making so much money, Flair was making so much money, and he comes in and making, you know, triple what we're making, so. It, it disrupted things, but, you know, and you, you say, well, if he's worth it, but he didn't, the numbers stayed the same. Didn't, didn't get any better. And that's the bottom line there. The numbers didn't get any better. Now, I don't know what he did after I was gone, or, you know, what they did with the Nitro thing. Maybe it, it happened, but. But as a baby face, it was just after the steroid stuff. It looked like he was off steroids, possibly, at that time. Because he had trunk significantly. Definitely was. Yeah, he had trunk. Yeah. But, you know, and to his credit, he, he still looked okay. You know. And what were the actual matches? What was he like in ring? Yeah, well, he was slow. You had to, I had to slow down substantially. There wasn't, I mean, you fight Rick, I mean, you know, he's, he's an athlete. Rick's the real deal. And, and Ho I'm not saying Hogan's not the real deal. He's Hulk Hogan deserves every bit of credit uh, you can give him for an in-ring star because he created that persona, everything. He did all that. But, you know, he was slowing down at this point and uh, you know, had a bad back. So, you know, he, he was doing the best he could with with what he had. And, you know, he could still make it work. He could still put it up and put it down. And something happened backstage in WCW uh, at a time when you were probably at your one of your peaks in popularity in America uh, with Paul Orndorff. That we've oh heard, my God! We've heard a lot of uh, his side of the story. Hey, you know, stop right there. You know what? Paul has made a living talking about this night, and he one of the one of the things he says. And, and you know what? I, I understand Paul's sick. I, I guess he's got throat cancer. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say this, but, you know, I was there that night, and Paul, Paul had a crippled right hand. His, his right hand was the same size as my wrist all the way up, all the way up to his shoulder. And that's the hand he, he hit me with. So, I, real quick, I've I got to tell the story because I've heard 
Paul, you know, it's like it's he won't let it die. It's like 50, 20 years ago he was saying this, and then today he's still saying it. He's still doing interviews about it. And, and one of the things he said was, you know, I got five extra years of my contract. He kind of smiled. And, and it, it, uh, it, it, I need to speak out because I never have, really. Well, this is the honest of God's truth, so help me God. This Eric Bischoff called me at 8 in the morning at the Marriott and said, Leon, you have promised me pictures for a photo shoot for weeks. You got to do them today or you're fired. And he says, I'm not kidding. So, hey, you get up and you go. Four hour photo shoot, and it's grueling, it's exhausting. And, uh, you know, where you had to go in your street clothes and then, um, you know, put your hot stuff on, get, get all pumped up, put your uniform on, and then start posing, right? And then, well, that photo doesn't look good. Let's do it again. That photo doesn't look good, you know. So it just became grueling. And I had told Eric, please call over and tell someone that I'm going to be late because I'm doing this. And, of course, he didn't do it. But I just did a photo shoot. I had my bag, and I went into the room and sat down. I, whew, I just did that traffic that, you know, from the Atlanta Towers over to the CNN Center. Yeah. And, and so what you're going to sit down, right? <laughs> so I sat down. He came in and said, you're fucking late. Why are you late? And I, you know, I was trying to explain to him, I said, Paul, like, politely, Paul, I mean, didn't someone tell you? Oh, I'm fucking doing this photo shoot. And uh, didn't Eric tell you? And uh, he said no and told me a fucking thing. I said, well, that doesn't give you a reason to fucking mistreat me. So then I said, you know, if that's not good enough for you, you can go fuck yourself because I've had it. I mean, this is, you know, I'm not getting cussed out by you. You're not my boss. And he thought he was. And you know what? I had been told specifically that... During that period of time, Dusty Rhodes was my boss, period. And Eric Bischoff, those two. Other than that, no one is above you. Those two guys. Yeah. And I think Sting had the same arrangement. Hogan had, well, maybe even a different arrangement. Maybe, maybe Eric Bischoff couldn't tell him what to do. But, um, so, but that's neither here nor there. So he, he turned around and walked out. And Terry Tater comes in and gets me, Leon, regardless of where you were or what, you know, uh, we got to do some interviews. So I got got my mask, took my shirt off, got my rubber hose so I could pump up, and I'm running to do the interviews. And Paul steps in and blocks me from going to the interviews. And uh, he called me everything in a book and threatened me to my face, face to face. So I slapped him. I thought that was a threat, a threat to my well-being and my safety. You know, hey, you're going to tell me you're going to beat the hell out of me? Well, you know, I'm going to defend myself. So I slapped him. His feet came off the ground, and he, he hit the, 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 his back hit the, the cement, and his head just met, missed this, this steel, steel toolbox where we that we'd put the tools to put the ring together. Right. I thought, my God, if his head hit that, I, uh, you know, I'm done. I mean, no matter why I'm late. I mean, if his head hits that and he's hurt, I'm fired and probably go to jail. And so I, I went over and put my hand on his chest. Paul, are you okay? And he looked like he was coming too because he hit the ground hard. I slapped the shit out of him. So Paul's got a right arm about the size of this wrist all the way up. And uh, he's 200, 200 pounds. I mean, he's really in bad shape, you know, physically. He's not the Paul Underf that you would, you know, that 260, 270 pound guy. He's like 200 pounds, 215. And... Uh, so when he gets up, he gets up, and I'm thinking, you know what, if, if I fight him back and, and, and do what I, I think I should do to defend myself, I'm going to get fired, at the very least, and maybe I'm going to hurt him, because he's just, so he, he, I thought I had slapped him initially, so I wanted to get that back, so I let him hit me in the face, and it was nothing, it was that, that, that weak right hand, and he hit me a second time, hit me a third time, and I drug him down with me, and Paul... Some, some of the, the wrestlers helped Paul up, and he kicked me once or twice before I got up. I remember that, and I got up and grabbed him, and we went into the coach's room, fighting like a wrestling type fight. But that was it. He had boots on. And like, you know, I don't know why that matters, but I guess if you're barefoot and slippers on, it's harder to fight somebody, right? But it was, I'm late, so what's he doing with slippers on? He's an agent, he's got his boots on. I mean, I, I, you know, and then the next day, how Paul had beat me up, and, and what they're seeing is those three hits to the face. And I mean, it was like, it was like my 12-year-old my son hitting me in the face. 
but my role was to be the the bad guy, beat everyone up. Yeah. So everyone that I wrestled, uh, I was spudding, right? Yeah. So it's like, like Regal. I remember Steve Regal. I mean, I kicked the shit out of Steve because it was my job too, you know. And he was very vocal about all that, you know. He said, "Yeah, you're not so tough now." And I said, "Steve, fuck." You know, so I just shut up and walked away. Is it true that uh, Ming was involved in breaking that up? Yeah. Then it was when I took him into the coach's room. Uh, a mean came up behind me and said, Leon, that's enough, you're going to hurt him. And that, you know, that, at that point, I didn't want to mess with me because that would have been a mistake, I think. He's one of the people that... Uh, you know what? He, not only was he fresh, I just kept on fighting, but no, nah, you don't want to mess with me. Did you ever get the chance to see him in action in a bar? I never did, but I'd heard about him. That sometimes is the, the worst... worst uh, you know, not seeing, you know, because you see, you say, well, you know, that, it ain't so good, or, or it is really good, but sometimes you can't see, you know. But that whole thing with Paul, and it, it's like, how many times have you heard that interview lately? He's still telling the same story. He's still getting over on this thing. It's like his thing, his, you know, his claim to fame. So he's hanging on to that bullshit story, and that's exactly what it is, it's bullshit. And ultimately, you got released over that, and... No, no, no. No? No, no. Ultimately, Eric Bischoff, and this was probably the second mistake I made, because getting into, you know, slapping Orndorff felt good, but it was wrong. I mean, no way should I punch first. Right, he got in my face. I said, go, I should have told him to go and take his best shot, and once he did, then I could have, you know, done anything I want with impunity. But, so that was the first mistake. The second mistake was when Eric, you know, he did send me home. And he, you know, I had heard that I was going over Hogan on the, on the first Nitro, which was coming up. And I was in suspension. So they were going to bring me out of suspension, you know, like this big thing. To have uh, a surprise. Yeah, surprise. and Because uh, at, at that point they hadn't made the deal with Luger. Luger they were looking yeah. for something big. And I was going around Hogan. Yeah, they were looking for something big. And, you know, I had heard that much to my surprise, Eric was in my corner saying, Hey, Leon, you know, it's a hard worker and he's... You know, he took that WCW belt for a year and never once, you know, had a bad match. And, and you were on the opening, actually, for the first Nitro, even though you never wrestled on Nitro. So yeah. You really add some so I heard that, and then, so Eric says, well, during this, this period of time off, you're, we want you to take a, a, a six-month pay cut, and that's a lot of money. I said, Eric, for, for this? I mean... I said, I can't see six months pay cut. I mean, that's, that's a half your salary. You know, that's, what, close to $400,000 fine. That's shit, man. I mean, how about 150, 200? I mean, something's, you know, and he wouldn't come off that. And so I told Eric that uh, if that was, was his decision that I, I was going to go elsewhere and that and I just wanted to bring up, you did mention your salary close to 400000 I don't know, if, if you want to talk about it, we can cut this that, out. That was half of it. Yeah, I'm only, yeah, that was half of it. I'm only going to bring this up because there was a recent podcast with Bruce Pritchard, and it was brought up on that podcast that you were making about around that 750 range, and Bruce Pritchard shot it down and said, no, there's no way Vader would have been making that much. How to, excuse me, how to end the bleep would Bruce Pitcher or WWE official know what I was making in WCW? Because the only two people that really know what I made was was Eric and I guess the, the excuse me, the WCW officials, the suits, and my agent and me. So and without saying the Everything numbers, else was just, you know, Ric Flair, well, come on Eric, tell me. So Eric shoots out a number to make Rick happy and... Eric's not going to, you know, Eric was under contract. I mean, he had, he had signed my contract. And it said, you know, confidentiality. We had a confidentiality clause. I didn't want no one to know. So, I mean, Flair, I mean, I'm not trying to bad my Flair, but someone, you know, like, hey, heard something and said something, so. So, basically, due to that pay cut reason, that's when you started talking to WWE? Uh, well, the fine. Oh, the I, fine, I didn't want to take the fine. Yeah. You know, they said, you know, you... You take the six month suspension and this fine, and uh, you can come back. And you know what? And I said to come back with my full contract. In other words, 
he said, "Yeah, I'll do that for you." And then in other words, the six months work wasn't work wasn't going to be deducted, which was very fair on Eric's part. And see, that didn't stick in my mind that I'd come back even after just after six months. Uh, you know, things would have been I could have been in great shape, lost some weight, got tan. You know, then came back and made a real run out of it. So what made you make the big jump finally? Uh, well, I got a settlement, you know. Uh, so we settled out on my contract, which was substantial because it was like, I don't know, six six years left. But, you know, if you multiply those six years of what it would have made, you know, so it was a bad mistake on my part. But uh, what, I don't know. I think pride and, you know, pride and business don't work. So that was a big big mistake. Before we move on from WCW, Dusty Rhodes was a booker for the, a lot of the time you were in WCW. What were your thoughts on him as a booker? Best, man. I mean, he made Vader. The first day, he just said, Leon, we're, we're, we're going to put you and Sting together and we're going to light this house on fire because before that, they had no, they didn't have anything. They didn't have a thing. And then, we, Sting and I caught fire, and then another another two caught fire, and then a tag team caught fire, and then suddenly the company was on fire. So it's like, you know, the term business creates business, and that's what this was, you know. Sting and I was creating other things because people say, hey, they're doing it, you know, it's, it's just contagious, you know. Is it true that they were going to originally call you the Mastodon when you switched? Or there was talk to Vince. Yeah. With Vince, Vince asked me. He said, "What about the Mastodon?" And um, you know what? Looking back on it, I mean, why not make Vince happy? I said, "No, I'm Big Van Vader. I'm, I mean, it's Vader time. You know why? Why would he change that? People aren't going to know who I am." And he said, "They're going to know who you are." And so Vince was talking to me on the phone, trying to talk me into the Mastodon, and I tell the boss, "No." It's like, come on. So you think that could have been a nail in your coffin ultimately? Well, it was like I was so sure of myself and. You know, and I, I was going in against Yokozuna, and here's this big 600-pound Samoan, and, uh, you know, I guess we had pretty good matches. It was just pretty much a slugfest. We stood there and slugged each other because you know, he just, after a while, he couldn't move, you know. Do you think they should have brought you in more with jobbers to kind of build you in WWE more rather than throw you in with a huge guy that's actually even heavier than you right away? Well... You know, who knows what what turned that whole thing. I mean, I don't know if I if I agree to the Mastodon, uh, you know, because he copyrights it. I guess that meant money for him. Yeah. And that's, that's why he likes to own everybody's name. Like that. Well, but you know, if if you're getting paid, what do I care? You know. Yeah. So it was just, it was a terrible mistake. So the next thing I know, I'm with Sean, and you know what? You're you're doing a few jobs for the champions. One thing, and then getting jobbed every night by the champion is another. So that's where it all went south for me. So you had a big feud with uh, Shawn Michaels. That was probably your most main event feud in uh, WWE. Uh, he's admitted that he was a different person at that time. He's since become a born-again Christian, and uh, he's not self-medicating as much as he used to. Granted, he did have back problems at that time as well, but he, he has admitted he was on a lot of uh, medication. Uh, what was it like working with him in those days uh, at the height of his uh, popularity and the height of his personal issues? Well, you know, I don't know a whole lot about his personal issues. I, I do know he had a bad back, and uh, it was always something I had to be cognizant of. You know, you know, me at 400 pounds and Sean at basically 200 and a little bit. Um, but bottom line with Sean, he was a perfectionist. and. Uh, if things weren't right, he'd let you know. And, and you know, I'm a perfectionist, and things were, you know, 99% right. But you know, there's always, when you're moving that fast, when you're when you're when you're thinking in front of 10,000 or 15,000 people, and, and we were averaging 10, 12, 15,000 people a house show with John and I. The house business really picked up. Um, my, you know, we we were, and you know, the matches were, you know, were excellent. They weren't just good; they were excellent. And, because with my size differential, I, you know, we we could we could make them feel for us, and when we popped it, man, they came, because they liked Sean. Sean was a great champion. Uh, 
And leading into that SummerSlam match, you had quite a long series of house show matches with Sean. I think that hurt it. We, I think I counted 19, and I told about the time I told Pritchard and Vince that. That's just my opinion, but uh, those matches, you know, where I was coming up on the losing end, I think they hurt the number, and it, was, it wasn't a good number. I think we would have had we done some DQs and maybe put me over a couple times. I mean, who knows what we would have done there. And of course, I got to ask about this because everyone always talks about it uh, because I guess Sean broke kayfabe during that SummerSlam match and actually yelled at you during a match for Messi. You know, like I said, he's a perfectionist. And um, there was a spot where he came off the top rope and was going to drop an elbow and I was supposed to move and I didn't. I forgot. And, hey, he let me know and we went on. But. Where would you rank Sean among uh, the top workers you've wrestled, like among the Mudas and the Stings and all that? Wow. You see, when you, when you mention Muda and you mention uh, Anoki, uh, Akiyama, Kobashi, those are pretty good wrestlers. Kobashi's, you know, gosh, Kobashi is limited athletic, but he's real big. But man, he's like a, like a machine. He just goes from one spot to the next and uh, rapidly. And it creates, he knows the Japanese timing, so he can create those big, uh, you know, pops. And, and, uh, and, and Anoki's Anoki, oh my, oh my God. But I think Flair is, is and should be in that group. Akiyama, Kobashi, Anoki. Who else did I say? I was asking if you would put Sean in that group. Yeah, definitely. I was going to. I was just gonna say that, uh, you know, I put I put Sting in that group, and I put uh, Sean probably at the top of that list. I don't know if Sean in his prime. I don't know if there is a better worker. And I, you know, I've kind of flip flopped this and saying that oh, Mizawa, Mits, probably Mizawa in his prime, Mitsuharu, Miza, Mits, Mitsuharu, Haru, Mizawa in his prime, because uh, Mizawa. He gained a bunch of weight, started smoking, and, and was chain smoking. When I worked for him and for Noah, and he all day long, every day, until he got in a match, he would smoke a cigarette one after another. And you know what? It still go 20 minutes. It's just incredible. You know, Japanese style, 20 minutes. So, I think Sean and him in their prime would probably, you know, and I'm talking about Mizawa's prime, probably when he was, you know, in his early 20s, 22, 23, 24, 25. And Sean, of course, is known as a great worker, a guy that's known a lot of times as a difficult worker, as the ultimate warrior. You had some matches with him in WWE. Uh, what were those like? Yeah, the warrior can't, we can't really mention him in this group, but uh, for me, I mean, it just, I think all, the warrior wanted, in other words, I don't think, in other words, warrior was used to people just standing back and watching him work and letting him do things. And with me, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like that. So, uh, you know, we'd lock up and engage him. And, uh, so I think he got really frustrated with what I was doing. And like, no, hey, no one treats me like this. So, <laughs> well, wait a minute, I, why not? So. Is it true that once uh, at a house show, you actually walked to the back in the middle of a match because you became frustrated with him, and then you ended up coming back to the ring to finish? I don't remember that. I really don't. I mean, if I I'm not trying to cop out, but I really don't remember. So I, That was one of the things that was discussed on the Bruce Pritchard recent podcast. And another thing that Bruce brought up was, I guess there was a rib played on you by Vince and uh, Owen at the Slammies. Yeah. Where the, yeah. I was pissed, legitimately. And you know what? It, uh, if I could have caught Owen, but Owen, he was too smart. He, he, as soon as he, he did that to me, I, I mean, I really reached for him, you know, all my NFL speed and explosion, I couldn't get to him, so. Were you working for the company the night that he passed away? No. I wasn't there. Were you uh, close with him at all? Yeah, I won when we started in Japan. One of my first, my first trip to Japan, Owen was on the roster, him and Steve Blackman. They were there. Speaking of Steve Blackman, uh, he's actually come out with a story where apparently, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but apparently there was some issue with uh, 
you guys in Japan and he showed up at a WWE show wanting to fight you or something. You know what? I, hey, if he wanted to fight me, why didn't he? I mean, I don't have anything good or bad to say about him. He, you know, he, uh, I mean, I, I don't think about him. I, I don't know. But it's like suddenly everyone's coming out of the woodwork now with, you know, it's like, um, I don't know. It's just, well, it's just one after another. One legitimate fighter uh, that you did work with was Ken Shamrock. Uh, what were those matches like? Because those were pretty st stiff matches. Well, I, 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 uh, I broke his ribs in the one cage. The ring was, the floor was like cement. I mean, literally. And uh, I picked him up and I think I'd, I'd hit him in the, the ribs with a, like a clothesline type thing. I caught him pretty good and then picked him up and slammed him, picked him up over my head, pressed him and brought him down, slammed him on that thing. Because you know what? Kenny was laying him in there. I mean, he'd hit you in the face and so you didn't mind hitting him back or you didn't mind slamming him pretty good. Like, hey, you know, if you're going to do that, and you know, I'm going to do this. and uh, But nothing but good things to say about Shamrock. But uh, he started coughing up blood. So, uh, and we just matched. You know, I won by, he, you know, he just couldn't go. And you had a couple matches with uh, with uh, Ahmed Johnson, who was known for being a bit of a sloppy worker. Uh, did you have any problems wrestling with him? No, he's a big, big, strong brawler. Yeah, big, big, big guy. Uh, working with Bret Hart, what were your memories of working with Bret? I know you were part of that Canadian Stampede match against him, I believe. You know, just I didn't understand. You know, it's like when you fight Shawn Michaels, you go, "Wow, there's real talent." Ric Flair, same thing. Sting, same thing. Anoki, same thing. All those guys over in Japan, Akiyama and Kobashi, and, you know, wow, these guys are talented. And then I didn't, I didn't, didn't see it. Brett was like, he's a pretty average worker. He just, you know, I mean, he, I'm not saying he's not capable of a great match, but it would have to be his style, that ground game where he's switching, and another wrestler, in other words, switch from hold to hold. But he couldn't adapt and, and get out of that style, you know. Uh, Was Bret Hart ever over really well in Japan? I know he spent some time there. I don't remember. You see that? I'm going to put myself over, but I mean, I don't know. Hogan Hogan got over in Japan, right? Right. I got over in Japan. Stan Hansen got over in Japan. I mean, I think Shawn Michaels. Uh, being as small as he would have, would have had a little more trouble, because uh, they would have peppered his ass. He would have really had to fight, but he would have got over. Flair would have gotten Flair. Well, you know, even, even Flair, did he really get over like Stan Hansen or? Uh, he wasn't team? on the level of those, but he fought top guys, I guess. Yeah, but was he over like like that, Stan Hansen? You know. I don't live in Japan, but I wouldn't say he's considered one of the guys on your. But level. I mean, he got over. I mean, but. I, I understand what you're saying, but it's like, it's, it's, I don't know, it's easier said than done, you know, in both places. Did you work with Vince Russo at all in WWE? Uh, yeah, a little bit. You know, he's a, has his own podcast now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I got a, something in an email that he wants to interview me. I, but you never had any issue with him? And uh, I'll just ask you about Bruce Pritchard because of his podcast. He said overall you guys got along well. Yeah, we did. I, I thought so. And I guess your last match in WWE was against Edge. Uh, do you have any memories of that? Yeah, Edge was a young, young kid and uh, scared. And I, I put him over. I beat him up a little bit and put him over. And uh, boy, he had a great career. Uh, what led to you leaving the WWE at that point? Yeah, it just my usefulness. In other words, as long as I was useful and, and making good money, I stayed. Uh, it, it wasn't the role I necessarily wanted to play, but I felt you know I'm I'm with the Undertaker. I'm with Sean. I'm with. Uh, oh, I didn't ask you about the Undertaker. I have to ask you about the Undertaker. Davey Boy. I'm with you know. So I was when I was productive. Whether it didn't matter whether I was being put over or not, it just mattered if, if I was part of the plan, you know. And then once I became not part of the plan, I got, yeah, 
pretty much I just asked for my, my leave and I went back to Japan. It was like 10 days, I, I left uh, WWE and I think it was 10 days later I was world champion for Baba. So. And before we just go back into that, uh, what was it like wrestling The Undertaker? <coughs> he has his own style and his own pace. His pace is a little slower because of the dead man routine. And I, I think it, you know, he knows how to do it. And it takes a longer match to get to people. You know, where if you work at a little quicker pace, you know, that, that whole the, the dead man and the, you know, the, I mean, he takes, everything's methodical. He takes the choke slam, he puts it over, you know, and then, you know what I'm saying? So, <clears throat> for me, I think things happen a little quicker now, you know, to build the spot, you know, to build that one where you get that big pop, and then you take it from there. So, he knows what he's doing, though. I'm not suggesting, it's saying that that's not my style. And so, you got along with him outside the ring, no problem. Oh, yeah, very much so. He's a great guy. But, uh, I think, yeah. I mean, what can you say? He's, God, he's, he's, he's Undertaker. So you went back to All Japan. As you said, you were champion very quickly. Did, was it them contacting you as soon as they found out? Uh, no, I had a, basically, I had something set up. You know, I had talked to Stan. And Stan said, Baba wants you at this much money. And that as soon as you get here, we're going to, uh, they're going to put the belt on you. And then once you give that up, then we're going to put, Tag belts with Stan and I, and we had to help. Stan, Stan was, you know, getting, uh, he's a little long in the tooth, I mean, but uh, boy, as a tag, talk about a tag partner, what a great partner. Jesus. Is it true if you hadn't gone to WWE that there was interest in making you guys a tag team around that time when you left WCW? Yeah, in uh, Japan? yeah, that was yeah. the first. Stan said, you come and we'll be tag champs, and probably is what I should have done, you yeah. know. Was Johnny Ace working for All Japan at that point? Yeah. Did you enjoy working with him? Yeah, Johnny was, you know. He, and you know what? Uh, the, the odd thing about it, he said he was going to go back when he got done wrestling. He was going to go back to America and get a job as a executive employee. <laughs> it's like, it's the one guy that I think did it. I mean, that's a tough nut to crack, you know, that. Okay. that uh, and his brother, of course, is Animal. I haven't asked you about the Road Warriors yet. Uh, they're of course one of the. They're on that same level as you in Japan, as far as popularity. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. Uh, did you have much contact with them over the years? Yeah, only wrestled a couple times in, in my prime and their prime, uh, but we, you know, we always got along good. And uh, Animal, I mean, great workers, a great, great tag team. And you won the uh, Noah tag team titles with uh, Scorpio when you were working in Japan yeah. as well. Uh, any thoughts on Scorpio? That's another guy we did an interview with. Scorpio, man, is just what a talent. Uh, Jesus, he can do anything. And and you know what? A great matchmaker. That's what make you know, other than the fact that he can do it in the ring, you know, it's great, but he, he could he could create in the in the locker room. And that's that was my forte. I could create in the locker room. In fact when you know, may, maybe because of my position and you know, within the company, but Pretty much everywhere I went, when I first started out with Anoki, uh, it was after that debut. Anoki was trying to call the match, and I kept, you know, saying, "Well, what if we did this? And what if we did this?" And, and then, so, you know, people always looked to me to call the matches throughout my career, except for maybe Sean. But even with with Sean, you know, I, I was pretty vocal. What would have been the highlight for you of that last run in Japan, uh, the last major run in Japan you had after WWE? Well, I had a couple of years with. Uh, Stan, and then Stan retired, and then uh, Baba died, and uh, Mizawa jumped ships, and he offered me. Uh, For people that don't know who Mizawa is, do you want to just Mitsuharu explain? Mitsuharu Mizawa, he's yeah. the, the Sachu son, the boss of uh, Noah, and he was, got a mega star as a uh, baby face heel for Baba, a baby face uh, uh, wrestler. And you also work with Kabashi too, I guess. Kabashi and yeah, and Ak Akiyama was real good. Kabashi I probably had my better matches with, but because uh, Akiyama was just, you know, he couldn't. Where where Kobashi could was, because I test him. I mean, I would, I would really lay it into him, and uh, Kabashi could. Akiyama would kind of fold with her, you know. 
There's a story that you apparently roughed up a Noah young boy that was uh, the son of one of the mafia guys, and they had a little confrontation with you in an elevator. Is there any truth to that? No. No. If, if you said I actually physically grabbed him. No, no. The story is uh, there's a there was a young boy in Noah that I guess you had one of your regular Vader style matches with. Nothing totally out of the ordinary, but because he was connected. You have to understand my position at this point. I mean, from Minoki, New Japan, to All Japan, to, I mean, I, you know, it's like Bruiser Bodie fighting Young Boy. No, be, do what you want. Beat him up. I mean, unless you really hurt him, which I never did. Right. I mean, I mean, if you, you know, if you try to break his wrist or his neck or something, maybe they would. Yeah. But, uh, no, you're just... They, it's good for him. I mean, that's, that was their style. And you ended up uh, having a couple matches in TNA. <laughs> Any thoughts on those? No, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was time to me to slow down. You know what, I, I was really getting out of shape at this point and uh, gaining weight, so I took a couple years off and I made a really big run uh, Come back. I mean, I had gotten in great shape. I was, I think I was like 400 pounds and just really overweight and out of shape. Uh, I was just tired and I, you know what? I, my knees hurt uh, so bad. In other words, when your knees go at my size, it just, you, they go and it's pain is so bad. In other words, you're taking eight, 10 pain pills a day just to, to walk around. And then when you, in other words, you'd wake up in the morning, you'd take two or three and then about halfway through the day, take two more, and then match time, you take three. You get to the match, and after the match, it really hurts. You have to take, so it's just, you know, and you're getting drugged out. I mean, it's starting to show. Um, um, so what I did is I went home. I, I knew that I just couldn't wrestle anymore uh, with his knees, so I, I got them replaced. I, I was living in Denver, and... Uh, I got a doctor and I replaced them and man, it's like, you know, I, I decided, well, God, I, someone said, you know, Stan said, Leon, I got new knees and they're great and you're going to find out they're great because that's who I was listening to. Stan's knees went and when his knees went is when he retired. My knees went and that's when I retired. That's, you can't do it. You cannot stand the pain. I, I fought it for a long time. I was getting extra pain pills. So I said one more year and I can, you know, I can have enough money where I can really be comfortable for a while and, you know take care of my knees. <clears throat> but, uh, so I got the knees done and, you know, lost some weight, got down to, what, 350, and had a real good run in the independent market, you know. And you were also a top star in UWF, which was a very shoot-style company in Japan. Is uh, there any reason why you never went into shoot fighting, just you were too old by the time it became popular? Yeah, yeah. that's it. If, if see when I was of a mind to do it, I said, well, how much money are they making? I mean, you can make more wrestling. Well, I'm making, yeah, I mean, a lot more, not you know, substantially more. So why would you take a risk having one of these guys, you know, really hurt you or beat you even worse? And either way, you're hurt, right? And for what? For just a little bit of money, you know, maybe a third of what you're making in a in a week, you know. Are you proud of your run in UWF, which was an extremely physical... It's not UWFI. UWFI, UWFI sorry. No, yeah. Got to get confused with Bill Watson. Yeah, I, I was the world champion. In other words, out of all those people, I mean, Dan Severn, you know, all those big Americans, like Gary Albright, myself, I mean, there was Tinta, and it just, you know, the list kept going. And, you know... Albright really wanted to get that first title, and he was vying for it. And uh, so the, their first, you know, Nobu Takata and I, we went 30 minutes in, uh, what, 50,000 people outside, outdoor arena in the tennis gardens, and we tore it down. So. Do you think that style of wrestling could get over in the States now? That yeah. Yeah, it, you'd have to, you would, I, you know, you'd have to let it go, though. In other words, what I saw that when I let it go, in other words, really start hitting these guys, 
you know, not not for a knockout, but letting it go. Yeah. You know, clubs, you know, when you hit a guy here, you're not going to knock him out. You, you yeah. come with a club here, you're not going to knock him out, but letting it go. You'll not, feel it, and you're not going to cause any serious damage. But, but you're going to knock like the piss out. Tackle. And uh, it, you could tell the crowd intensity came. But if you got a, a shooter working a shoot that's, you know, holding back his uh, <coughs> uh, punches, then it just it, it's actually worse than a worked worked wrestling match. Now on the opposite end here now I see and even in, it's happening in Japan and some companies there's people doing these this dick grabbing stuff and there's people wrestling invisible wrestlers. All these sick. It's like yeah. How. I saw a picture in the Japanese magazine. This guy was on his knees selling, and he had a hold of this guy's nuts. It's like, wh where's, where's that? How, how did that occur? I mean, I don't understand the style. What, what is it? It's disgusting. You can't even really defend wrestling now if someone says, look no. what happens in pro wrestling. How can you defend that? You can't defend that. But <laughs> Oh, my God. I saw that, and I went, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a there's lots of copycats of that now. I know you probably don't follow it as much as uh, I do because I'm younger, but yeah, it's unfortunate. And I understand that you were a high school uh, football coach again at one point. Is that true? Uh, Not again, but you went back to coaching football. That's on the internet anyways. Uh, yeah, at a, at a college, at a, okay, at a junior college, yeah. What were your intentions with that? Just You know what? Did that See if they'd get hired, you know. I wanted to be the uh, defensive coordinator. And you know what, it would have been a huge cut in pay and, you know. But you only work, you get paid the whole year and you only work, you know, two or three months. I know you follow MMA a little bit. Did you happen to see CM Punk's MMA match recently? No, I didn't. And you know what, I'm not going to beat up on Punk and uh, I wish him all the best. I, I think he's courageous, um, you know, for trying because... I, I don't think he has the tools, the physicality to be a shoot fighter, and yet he's trying. And you know, I don't know if he's getting paid. Apparently, he made five hundred thousand for that one. That one match, well, yeah. <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. He wants to have another one. He's trying to get another one. I don't. You know, I don't see him. I mean, other than having one match every three years, I don't see him having a very long career. He's, I don't, did you see him in that picture, in the, the recent photo? He, he just, he looked anemic. It's skinny neck, skinny arms. It's like all this time in the gym, and just even a light weight like him would have developed muscularity. Do you think that it's good for the wrestling business that, uh, I think he was a three-time WWE champion could be dismantled so quickly in MMA. Is that good for the overall health of the wrestling business? No, uh, I, I I think it's a, it's apples and oranges, and and certainly Punk was over because he could talk, not because he could wrestle. His his average, he's pretty average wrestling. He just didn't have the physicality, didn't have the strength, didn't have the believability. I mean, you know, if uh, like Bill Goldberg, he's. He's not the best wrestler in the world, but he's believable because he's so physical, you know. Did you see Bill Goldberg's return recently? Yeah, yeah. What do you think of Goldberg coming back and being the top guy again? Good for business. I mean, they did a number, right? They, Brock Lesnar and him, and, and you know, they'll do another number. That'll be a huge, huge match when they come back. That's business, man. What do you think of uh, Lesnar, since you bring up his name? Brock? Yeah. Shit, he's the real deal, right? I mean, you know, I think Brock come back to beat Goldberg, right? Just my opinion. And then where's Brock go? And man, that the monster is six foot eight, Braun Strowman. Wow, and just power galore. I mean, Brock is so proud. In other words, when you saw Brock fight, uh, Mark Hunt. No. Wrestler. Oh, uh, the I don't watch it. Samoan, Samoan Italian. Oh, Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns. Man, he was serious, and, and he wouldn't let Roman. Roman tried to fight back. You would think, well, come on, give him a little bit. He wouldn't. He just kept snuffing him and snuffing him and snuffing him. So, uh, 
people have compared me in my prime to Brock, and uh, and obviously I didn't have the amateur skills. So in other words, if I would have fought Brock, you know, maybe if if I could still made him standing up, you know, he could always take me down. And you know, when you get tired, a guy that's an amateur that's got amateur skills is gonna is gonna get over. And then uh, just for sheer size, you know, I mean, I didn't have the height, but I had the same weight, and I had the same strength advantage over. You know, it's like he has he he has no fear. I mean, it's just and, and Brock's the only one that could even even come close. What do you think of Randy Orton? Good worker, probably one of the best workers on the roster. He's probably the best. Uh, just I don't think he's ever. I don't know. I don't know why he's you know. Has he been champion? He has, right? Oh yes, many yeah. times. Yeah. I know he may have been the youngest champion ever. Actually. Yeah. And John Cena, I got to ask you about him. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to argue success. I mean, Jesus, God, he's just broke Ric Flair's record. He's making one one year, he made twenty five million. He's doing great. He's what doing about great. the uh, the Rock, who's probably one of the biggest stars in Hollywood, if not the biggest now? Is the biggest. He's the biggest box office. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. He's doing fifty million a year for the last five six years. So <laughs> that's. That's tough enough, man. Who would you like to wrestle the most out of today's stars if you could have a match with one of today's guys? I don't know. In my prime? Yeah. 93, 92, 91. And I was, I was so strong. I don't know, a wrestling match, not a shoot? Yeah. Uh, God, probably Lesnar. And right after he beat Charles Braun, you know, because you got to figure they're going to put him over. But that would be that would be Braun's first defeat. And you got to watch this guy if you haven't seen him. You haven't seen him yet? No. No, since he came, brother, he's he's a foot taller than everybody. He's as, you know he's as tall as LeBron James. And he's four hundred pounds. That's impressive. I will. And he's not. You know what? There's not an ounce of fat. It's just ripped. That's scary. What do you see for the uh, for the future in general of the wrestling business now that there's only really one main company in in uh, North America and worldwide really, but New Japan still exists. It's pretty strong, but uh, like it seems like the wrestling business overall, there's less places to work for wrestlers. Do you see that a bright future? Do you see other companies popping up? Yeah, I see other people. I, I you know what? It's like Japan is limiting access. You know. You have to pay your own ticket to get over there, right? Unless you're with New Japan, from what I understand, if you're an American, yeah. Yeah. There's less less money so in so other they're, countries. They're limiting access, and the, the, you really want it. To, you, you know, you really want to come. Uh, there's one kid uh, over in England, a little lightweight. Oh, Will Osprey, that I think I've heard that he's really him. talented. I had a match with him. My back was hurt. I couldn't do much, but you know, I beat him and went over and. Uh, he's real talented. He, he's got a lot of great gymnastic skills, and he's he's leaning toward the gymnastics side rather than the story side. And he, he what he needs is just just bring it back a little, bring the gymnastics back just a tad, and and tell a story. And man, he'd be so good. It's scary. Did you enjoy that match? Yeah, yeah, I did. You know, just him flipping around, me catching him, and and. Chokes lemon him and then beating the hell out of him for a little bit and then let him do it again. It was just a series of spots, nothing complicated. Just me stopping him, popping him, popping him, popping him. He got you know he got someone that can do. He's phenomenal. He's not just good. He's phenomenal. I understand the crowds are uh, pretty good over there too. Yeah, they ago. were hot. They were really. They hated me. It was like fuck. Bleep you, Vader. Before the match, I never heard that. Straight out, the F U C and the bump. If any uh, UK promoter sees this, would you be open for a rematch with him? No, he's already said he don't want one. Yeah. <laughs> and what would you like your uh, legacy to be in this business uh, when people look back on it? I don't know. I'm getting, you know, best big man ever, uh, best super heavyweight ever. I think that's realistic. I don't know, you know. I don't know. That's Every tweet I get has something to do with uh, the Hall of Fame and um, being, you know, the best.
best ever, at, at either the best big man or the best super heavyweight. I think more appropriate the best super heavyweight, because, you know, there's like Andre's a giant, I'm a super heavyweight, Undertaker's a big man at three, 320. Right. Know. Kane's a big man. You know, and myself. just to set the record straight, in my opinion anyways, a lot of people will put Bam Bam Bigelow in your category as best he heavyweight. Should. But was Super he ever heavy. as over as you in Japan, or really in North America? Yeah, he was a title in Japan, except the tag belt with me. And there's a reason for that. And he couldn't, he couldn't put, you know, after 10 he was done. And they, they needed you to go 15, 20, and 25, and often 30. And I, I had conversations, I said, I said, why not drop, drop to Bam Bam? Because you can't depend on him to be in shape. So, yeah, I don't know if that makes him good or, or bad or... He just, he didn't have the, he was a diabetic early, and I guess that's why he, complications from diabetes, he died. And then may he rest in peace, but Bam Bam was, was, well, really talented, you know. And, and, and uh, as a tag team guy, because, you know, you could go spell him, you know, and, and vice versa. And I'm not saying he would short on me in, in, a, in a tag match, because, in other words, I would go out there and I'd go as long as I could. Right, and when we were tag team champions, and then he would do the same in return. So we were, I mean, you know, we had 800 pounds. We were a really good tag team, and it was, you know, to see about the same height, you know, six two, six three, and and uh, both 400 pounds. And your son was in uh, WWE under developmental contract for a while. Yeah, he got hurt. He uh, tore up his leg and uh, was out 200 days rehabbing that. And then he came back from that and then hurt his back. And uh, the, this, you know, it was time to part ways. And he, it, I think it was good, you know, because Jesse, Jesse landed on his feet. He, he left and he got a great job in Dallas. I mean, he's, he's making a lot of money, you know. And he's very secure with what he's doing. You mentioned Twitter a few times. Uh, for people who want to follow you on Twitter, what's your Twitter handle? At It's Vader Time. Follow me. It's hilarious. <laughs> Is that the only social media you have? or you Yeah, have that's it. That's all I care to have. I uh, I like tweeting, though. I enjoy it. It's like it's, I, I seem to constantly be looking for my phone and, you know, I want to check if I got a tweet. Or, yeah, it's fun. So that's your legitimate one, and it's you answering for anyone that wants to see it. Yeah. If you got a booking, man. Yeah, if anyone wants to book you, it's through Twitter. I, I, I am still wrestling, and uh, I've got doctor's approval where I can wrestle at this point. And uh, uh, shoot, it'd be great crap. And for fans that want to see you in the WWE Hall of Fame, what do you suggest they do? I can't. <laughs> I can't. You know what? I, I'm, I'm grateful to be considered, and uh, uh, I, hope, I hope I will be considered. But you just can't, you can't piss these guys off, you can't. You have some big people pull in for you, some big people on your side, so you never know. Man, that's nice, it really is. Are you going to be doing or, uh, autographs or anything in Orlando this year? I hope so, I did the last couple of years. Uh, but you never know, with this illness, they might, you know, I don't know. It's like, do you think it would be awkward around the other guys to me? If Abdullah the Butcher is showing up to this, this thing, I'm sure it's not going to be awkward for you to come in. Abdullah Butcher, he's shown up to the Hall of Fame thing. He well to the autograph sessions. Not oh, you were you're talking about the actual WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if it'll be awkward for that. I thought you meant like the WrestleCons and stuff like that. Because yeah. there's all sorts of autograph things. We're going WrestleCon. Well, you will be at WrestleCon. Yeah, yeah. got yeah. So. You want to go to the cork and get a steak? Sure. The prime rib. Definitely. We'll split this one. This will be expensive town. And uh, finally, any message to your fans that are watching this? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I kind of want to end up this, this interview. It's like, I don't know. It, it's kind of a surreal feeling to, you know, be told by a heart specialist that you have two years to live. And yet, I don't feel uh, as if I'm dying. I... Uh, I feel good. I, I, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel better than I did before. Um, he told me, and I kind of want to go thank him because, you know, 
I'm taking my vitamins, I'm, I've lost weight, I'm riding the bike literally a half hour every day, and that's hard to do for me. It's just mentally you get to 15 minutes and you go, oh, that's enough, right? But I push forward to, you know, to, to 30 minutes and I'm working out every day. So I feel good, I'm looking better. And, I, you know, I kind of owe that to this guy. So, but I uh, will probably be, you know, coming up with an announcement soon. I'm going, going to Atlanta and spend some time with Diamond Dallas Page. And uh, the goal is to lose 100 pounds and eat better. And he's going to take care of all that. And I, I can't thank uh, Diamond enough. But you know what his signs are? His Twitter and all that stuff? Uh, we'll, we'll put it at the end of this. Yeah, please do. Diamond Dallas Page, at Diamond Dallas Page. It'll be in the end credits anyway. Yeah, more. end credits, and then, uh, um, uh, and then I'm going to go to Plano, and again, there's with some of the best hearts, hard people in the world, and you know, the, the United States and the world, let me put it that way. So, I, uh, I feel fine. I, I uh, Take it from there. All right. Thank you very much, and best of luck with your health. You bet. And just for your fans, uh, can you give us one? It's uh, time. It's time. It's Vader time. You think it'll be the last one ever? That's why you. You know, it's not going to be the last one. But from the power, I said, from the power of the Rocky Mountains and Boulder, Colorado, I bring you the Prince of Power. For it's time. It's time. It's Big Van Vader time.